you know, young kids and stuff. What's a DVD, mom? You know, we got them at the booth. Like, what's oh, a DVD dude. player? Well, like, when I buy one to watch this, people are going to come to my house. I'll be like, what's that? I'll be like, that's my white tail adrenaline machine. <laughs> yeah. The Hunter Podcast is brought to you by Deer Grow. Heck yeah, man. Dude, we put a lot of food in the ground every year, you know, seemingly more and more, and uh, we have a ton of fun with it during the off season. Uh, there's some struggles that come with it too, though, right? Obviously, the back of my truck is evidence, you know, right now, it's mm-hmm. a couple weeks after uh, I jackknifed, you know, a 4 800 pound uh, material spreader, you know, as I was coming down, and it's just it was too much weight for my truck there. But, you know, all those struggles aside, you know, dude, Deer Grill really has been a staple for our food plotting process uh, for several years now. Yes, we like to put lime and fertilizer on the plots, you know, if we can, but there are some that it's just we're not able to get to them or it's not feasible for us to get out of state with that stuff and so deer grow is kind of the, the quick and easy but still super effective option for us to be able to get the most out of those food plots that we can every year and i mean we're guilty of over analyzing things just like everyone else but that's the best part about deer grow is that it's going to create healthier soils which in turn makes better food plots and the fact is is we can simply spray plot start or plot till when we put the seed in the ground and then when that plant starts to grow we hit it with boost and we know that we walk away when we come back, it's going to be a great looking food plot. For anybody that's looking to try Deer Grow, if you use the code HUNTER15, that's H-U-N-T-R-1-5 at checkout for DeerGrow.com, and save 15% on any of your Deer Grow products. It's a great way to get started on this and just see what the results are for yourself. Better food plots, bigger deer. And we're back. Hey, well. Hunter Podcast. Episode 166 is oh. you kept me in Did you hear me breathe in there before you started? <laughs> yeah. A little na- nasally. <laughs> yeah, we've we've had a streak of that. Nick is not here. He's snowed in on the mountain, um, <laughs> as it should be. Um, rest in peace. Rest in peace, yeah. So we're kind of running on the uh, the solo schedule without a producer. In the, in the dead of winter. Yeah, we're kind of in that creep. It is. Doesn't it feel like winter's kind of almost over at the end of December, and then you realize it hasn't started yet? It hasn't even yet? started. Yeah, it's January 19th. We are in the the heart of it. I could really do without January and February. They are pretty useless. We bitch about it a lot, but I can't imagine being like in the upper Midwest where it's like, it was like negative 50 with the wind chill the other day. Like, what do you do? Yeah. You stay inside. Or you, it was just kind of tough. I don't know. It's different kind of cold, too, though. It's... It's a dry yeah, cold. It just says what it is. It's dry. It's just dry. Yeah. <laughs> it's a dry not, It's not the heat. It's the humidity that'll get you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you want to do your part? Yeah. Hey, thank you guys for listening. Uh, whether you're on YouTube, Spotify, or Apple Podcasts, uh, we appreciate you guys tuning in. Uh, Jeremy and I do try to keep up with uh, comments, and if you guys are writing in, you know, I've, we got a lot of those here recently, so I apologize for the delay in any of that, but we are trying, and we do appreciate you being here, so thank you. We do, and we try to keep up with them. We've been getting caught up here in the last couple of days. Um, a lot of a lot of theories on the Alexander buck. It's been it's mm-hmm, been fun. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would say overwhelmingly, that's what a lot of the write-ins have been about about speculation. Speculations. And, um, yeah. A lot of people from the town of Wilmington, which if you haven't figured out by now, that's that's about where this deer was living and mm-hmm. stuff. So that's been fun. You know, a lot lot of speculations flying around out there, and uh, it'll be interesting to see how that all shakes out. Yeah, I mean, hopefully we kind of get some uh, light shone shine shined on mm-hmm. it. Shine did. Ended <laughs> on that here soon. I mean, it seems like they're, you know, whatever the case is going to be, we should be able to hear it here soon. Uh, we don't know anything. Do you think so? Is that? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I would say so. I would say we're coming to a head here pretty quickly. In what form do you think that will be? Is that a, like a formal statement or is that just like the case is going to be? I would assume it comes in the form of an indictment, like a formal indictment on you know, whatever the charges could or could not be. Um, Because that first, like the first public, like what has happened so far, like CJ's not under arrest. He's not been indicted for anything. They're just investigating it. And so temporarily they're like holding uh, the cape, the antlers, et cetera. Mm. Um, if, If things come back clear, then I would assume he or Keith or whoever has possession of him gets them back. Um, but yeah, so I don't know what that'll look like. But I would assume the next step is going to be, would be either he's clear and we made a mistake or like formal charges are brought up, which would then go to a court hearing (laughs) Um, because we're not at that stage yet for anything. Got it. So there's some interesting, um, interesting, you know, kind of theories around that one guy, which makes sense. 
to be honest, is, you know, we've kind of huddled around this, like he didn't have written permission to be on the property because he trespassed and da, 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 da. And like the reality is, is uh, somebody made a point. Um, maybe that written permission was on his sister's property that he didn't have the, whatever the proper permission to be on that. And they used that because they knew they could get him on that to open up Pandora's box to other things. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and I say that because we're all saying, well, he trespassed, he did this, or this is what this, you know, speculation is. Um, ultimately, it could have been the fact that they said, well, he didn't have written permission. He couldn't show that to us at the time that this happened. We're going to use that. And that's kind of the probable cause now to open up Pandora's box to what else has happened here. Um, yeah. Which would make a lot of sense. Um, because remember, that first release was very, like, weird none of when it yeah. came out it was like vague that's it like that's pretty underwhelming for you to make such a big deal about this thing sure well he claims that he did have written permission on a sister whether that's true or not i i haven't seen it from i myself, mean i would but. assume just to have that statement though they have to have some pretty factual proof that he did not whether it was because it wasn't in his sister's name yet or he so. needed permission from both the own i don't know but mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, we'll see, but that that's where a lot of the messages come up. Obviously, Wadi being on, we got a lot of response around that. I think people have been waiting for that, and we've known, you know, Michael for a long time on that. So, uh, we got another cool guest today. Um, so, we were talking about it even pre-podcast before he was on here of, like, I can't, I mean, maybe 10 years ago is when we started watching this stuff. Um, maybe. You know, probably. Yeah, long time. Probably one of the only things I still buy on DVD anymore. <laughs> Right. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it, it is that like we were just talking about over here, like here's all the old DVDs stacked up that like, you know, I remember getting them in and passing There's around only the DVDs I have. Like I have a, like if you want to call it a library at my house, it's like, yeah. a, it's a, it's a, it's a milk crate or something yeah. like that. I have that few books. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, but what I do have on there is I have all the old white tail adrenaline DVDs. Yeah. And so, and, and it's funny because yeah. we, I remember passing them around the office, like during, like, you know, when it's October, That's November, what we did. just have them streaming on TVs when, around the yeah, office. Yeah. When we had everybody in the one room, we would mm. just pass around. DVD. Are you, are you done with, uh, you done, you done with that one yet? Yeah. Pass it, pass it around. Yeah. So <laughs> pretty funny. So, uh, we've got Jared Scheffler on today. Mm -hmm. Uh, excited to talk to Jared. Uh, um, you know, obviously about the white, the white tail adrenaline, where it's at now, but, but really kind of to hear some of the stories and discussions, you know, of, of where it's come from. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> you know, and, and see his thoughts on even like how this thing has progressed and, and what it's morphed into. We talked about it. Well, I'll probably see, I'll pop in and see Jared over at great American outdoor show here in a few weeks. Like he, he does a big trade show schedule as well. I know he meets a lot of people that way. Yeah. Um, but yeah, pr pretty cool because, um, going into maybe that past conversation with Wadi around, you know, hunting content and stuff, you know, and it's not as a disrespect. It's just that, you know, there aren't, doesn't feel like there's many people that it's like when something comes out, you're like, ooh, like I'm stoked, you know, to see that stuff. Mm -hmm. Jared and Whitetail Adrenaline is one of them. Yeah. Um, well, these guys have been doing their own thing just for as, lo as long as I can remember, which, uh, get, you know, for us gives them uh, those guys a lot of respect. It's just, yeah, do your own thing, dude. Mm -hmm. I don't think that they're, it says right on the DVD that I, I don't think they have sponsors. Maybe they have some, some small stuff, but um, it was birthed out of that, like, hey, we're, we're sick of like just these big TV show personalities and yep. like the, you know, shoving crap products down your throat. So it's just, it's long form, you know, fairly uncut, just raw hunts, you know, yep. and, and untraditional stuff for the most part too. It's a lot of spot and stock. I mm -hmm. think a lot of theirs is there's Western Kansas or what part of Kansas, but a uh, lot, a lot of driving, a lot of, you know, a lot of miles. And it's, I don't know how many hours of content are, is in this new uncut DVD. If it's eight, 18 hours, 15, 15 hours. Yeah. So that, and the fact that neither Jeremy or I have a DVD player is the, is the sole reason. And I'm below Jared apology here that we haven't been able to watch it yet. So it's, yeah. it's purchased. We just got the uncuffed. It's purchased. Not long it's sitting ago. here. I'm like, where yeah. do I get a DVD player? Yeah. You know, where, yeah. I, where I find it used to be, well, we talked about it passing around the office. It used to be all my computers. Yeah. Had one. We used to have our desktops. I used to throw it in. And now like even I have a desktop and I looked the other day and I'm like, huh, doesn't have one. <laughs> Did, yeah. I didn't even know it. I didn't even pay attention. I to woke it. up last night, like, thinking i was like like i was not a cd rom player but i was like does my truck even have like a player anymore like i'm no. thinking of things that read discs in today's no. day and age no it's um, i mean and that's crazy because it hasn't been that long that we were watching those in the office all the time i'm gonna so. end up buying one just so i can watch these and it'll, it'll yeah, be worth i found it, one i have one so okay maybe i'll borrow one. it when you're done i got it um well cool let's uh let's bring jared in all right and we got jared on here we go 
<laughs> Sorry, I'm late for the meeting. Ah, oh, dude, no. Or if the, the, we, the, I don't know the, how I had 9 a.m. In, in my head, and so well, it's the time zone thing. We get it all the time. Like I, you know, I get so used to sending time zones, but when I get them, I'm also like. I don't remember. Was that my Jeremy time was like, zone? is it possible he thought Central? I'm like, I read the text, but I was like, there's no possible way he thought that I meant Central time. No, I, I'm sorry about that. I, I had nine for some reason in my head. And then when I joined the meeting here, it, it did say 930. You guys, is t- you know, or whatever. So it's totally anyway, fine, dude. We've we've now. we've learned to, uh, you know, be, be gracious. We're loosey goosey so, in yeah. this thing. Yeah. I wouldn't be right if I wasn't a little bit late. Right? Yeah, there you go. I think that's I think that's perfect. <laughs> our our listeners will get will get a uh, a laugh out of. I was gagging you earlier. I said this is not a damn DVD release. I said we, we expect you to be <laughs> on time. I, I I could hear all the shit talking. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's right. Uh, yeah, you, you he can he can still hear it. We're oh, yeah. mm. Well, cool, dude. Well, we appreciate you joining us. Uh, where are you at right now? Where Where are you living at? I live in Iowa. You do yeah, live in I'm Iowa. In Yes, I I moved down here May first of last year. Oh wow! Okay. Wow. Yeah. So do you are you an official Iowa resident now? I am. Oh, yeah. Yeah. a lot of so, jealous people at this point. Yeah. Then. Well, it was a long time, <laughs> long time come, and Chancey had been working on me for <laughs> at least a decade to get get down, you know, and it just never never worked out. And then five, six years ago or so, approximately, I was gonna move and and almost moved, and then almost kind of started to do a partial move. And then I just, you know, there's just a lot of moving parts and a lot of, a lot of busyness with what I do. And I was just like, I can't do it this year, you know, and I put it off and, and finally I just, uh, some, some dots aligned. I I was renting in Wisconsin and the guy didn't, uh, didn't, he, he wanted to sell the place. And, and I was like, well, I've been there for nine years. I'll, I guess I gotta, I gotta go or buy it. (laughs) So, I was like, perfect time to move. There you so, go, man. What part of Iowa did you end up in? I I actually, just on the west side of Des Moines, I want to stay close to the, pretty centrally located yep. uh, for, for a number of reasons. So, um, mm-hmm. so yeah. I've, um, I've heard that Des Moines area is really nice. I love it. Yeah. I, you know, I, I've spent a lot of time in Des Moines uh, for, yeah, probably 13 13 years at least, you know, around with, you, you got the Iowa deer classic and mm-hmm. different people. I've gotten to know quite a few people and I've traveled quite a bit of the country, a lot of the Midwest. And, and, uh, I'll tell you, it's a great place. Great mm. place to when you, uh, have you bought your first tag out there? Uh, I guess this past I year. did, I did last year. The, yep. <laughs> uh, funny thing about it is, is the last two years, you know, I've, I've had my Iowa residency and I haven't even bought bought a muzzle litter tag or gun tag. That's, you know, I just oh. didn't have time last year cause I was already late on this uncuffed at it. And then this year, just, just some things, uh, just busy with, with, with shipping and yep. uncuffed and, sure. and, uh, <laughs> I got to get back to a friend of mine. He he messaged me about coming to Ohio for muzzleloader hunting, and I was so swamped. I just spaced out just now till just now. He he messaged me about that. <laughs> that was and two, that was two weekends ago, that, brother. That was like early January. Until he messaged that, I was like, I don't even. I, I didn't. I haven't even bought an Iowa muzzleloader tag. Like I haven't even thought about it. Like, That's funny, man. Well, it's kind of interesting because, like, you know, I well, we talked about you know, watching where Whitetail Adrenaline was and, and how it's evolved, yeah. you know, back in the day, and it, obviously not saying that you don't now, but I mean, a lot of it was us following you, Jared, with, you know, the stick bow on a lot of these spot and stocks. And, you know, I think you probably know it more than anyone, the weight of kind of being in front of the camera, but also knowing what's being captured for that post-production a- effort and stuff. I mean, that's a lot, man. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Uh, to put things into perspective uncuffed i i know we're around 500 hours of raw content holy cow to 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 that that it started on i mean by the time i got done with the production and exported uh, it's a 109 point something terabyte storage tower that i have (laughs) and there's only a couple terabytes left wow (laughs) that's nuts man actually to do some of my other exports i don't have enough room on that raid so it's it's by the time i'm done it's over 110 terabytes how wow. many guys do you have filming now like how many cameras uh, 
you know, three main, and I, yeah. I've got a couple other buddies. Uh, uh, Dan Burns, he's he stepped in, uh, not the last few years he hasn't, uh, but um, and then I got a buddy Eric. But my the main guys I've got are Matt Matt mm-hmm. Tenniel. He's been he's been with with uh, me f- since 2017. Mm-hmm. Um, and then uh, Ethan Lamarande with an E mm-hmm. at the end. With an oh, E. I got a on his credits. <laughs> so uh, anyway, we call him Lamborghini. Um, <laughs> and then uh, TC. TC's yeah. uh, he's he's been he, now TC wasn't there for the filming of this uncuff, but he was there for the next one. Because that's so. got to make it difficult. You know, it, it's one thing if you're behind the camera all the time, knowing what's being captured, like in your yeah. head, also kind of playing the producer side of thing. Versus you've got multiple camera guys, you're collecting more content, but then trying to wrangle that all in. I mean, you've yeah. got to watch it. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, you know, you think about that, you got 500 hours of raw content, that's 500 hours just to watch it. Yeah. If you watch it all, and most of it does get, you know, gone through. Um, you know, it, in fact, up until a few years ago, every ounce of everything we captured, every second, went gone through that's just to watch it that's just to look at what you got yeah you know, i mean that's a quarter of a person's work here and then you're actually gonna like carve it out and you know it's like what it is basically in a nutshell is because it's true unscripted and there's no forced storyline or you know the characters aren't going into a forced state of explanation it's just a bunch of chaos and rambling and and then <laughs> the editor is left with this giant mess you yeah. know, it's not like, you know, with a, a movie set, which is has its own difficulties and different, it's more of a, you know, you'd have a script and you hand this off to an editor. Well, it's easy to find a bunch of good editors to produce that because it's like, I want take three of this scene, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, it's yeah. laid out. It's, it's pretty, in this, it's like, no, you, you, you got this giant, however many thousands of puzzle pieces, you pour it out and you start. And a lot of the puzzle pieces don't belong. They right. won't flow the same. They won't connect. So I, I, that's maybe a difficult way to explain it, but that's that's kind of what it No, that makes sense. It's a whole project in and of itself. It's almost just like, let's... Do you, are you guys giving thought to the, the production uh, you know, phase while you're out filming? I assume by now it, there is some of that just in, inherently. In, in terms of... Uh, you know, like one way to go about it is you could just say, hey, we're going to we're just going to hunt and we're going to run cameras and that is going to be that at the very end of it, we're going to look at what we got and we're going to start from scratch and and build a storyline. Maybe that is what happened originally, but probably now there's some element in your mind of you're like, Hey, you know, I got to make sure this flows from this to that. Let's, let's do things strategically. So that makes my life easier down the road. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, somebody that, that to be really good out there capturing this stuff, you either have to have an editing background or you have to really understand. Yeah editing you know like matt's not an ed- editor but he he really understands the editing process enough to where when he's filming he's like okay i need this shot i need this shot i need this shot and i gotta capture it right now mm-hmm. and and that's that's the hard thing for a lot of a lot of uh you know a lot of guys can run a camera but can you do you have the ability to to in the moment recognize this is happening. I need to capture this now. And I need this piece, this piece, this piece, and, and all of that. Mm-hmm. So that when the editor gets it, he can build a story out of it. Yeah. And if you don't have that, you don't have much. And, it, you know, and I think it, if people watch the earlier stuff, um, you know, and, and there's, there's things I, you know, I haven't went back. Someday I'll walk, go back and watch them all. But there's storylines that are left hanging or missing parts. And it's like, whoa, what happened? Well, we didn't have anything. <laughs> yeah, nothing we was don't there. go back and produce anything. You know, right. it's like, that's what we got. That's, yeah. that's the format. It's been true, raw, unscripted. And I also don't like the characters going into like a state. Like if I wanted to tell a story and edit it quick, I would go into a forced conscious state of like, okay, I'm going to explain this. This is the setting. This is, mm-hmm. you know, but it's just, it just don't, it's not my thing. It, it doesn't flow the same. You know, every production has their their style, their genre, their type, their way. And I, I I can appreciate a lot of that, but it's just not the format of Whitetail Adrenaline. I, I, I think if I, I was going to produce something 
you know, more along a different format, I'd, I'd probably do a spinoff of some sort to, yeah. to keep the separation of the genres. Huh. If that kind of makes sense. Yeah, man, I think it does. So, I mean, if we take that step back, Jared, like, uh, so were you born and raised in Wisconsin? I was, yes. So where, yep. at what, in Wisconsin. so at what point did you, cause like I, I joke about it all the time. I, I go back, I've got like old school videos and like, man, it, around that 2000 mark, probably 99, 2000 was when like, you know, mini, mini DVs and stuff. And I was out there recording with my buddies and like just having a blast doing it. I mean, where did that, when did that happen for you? Like what, what was that trigger? I guess that happened when I was 16. Okay. Um, so how long ago was that Jared? <laughs> so that would have been 2001. Yeah. I'm an, I'm old. <laughs> no, me too, dude. Uh, me too. I'll be 40 in April. So but yeah, that would have been 20, 20, almost 23. Well, that, yeah. Upcoming, but, uh, 23 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Um, S scary to think that, but <laughs> I, I really, you know, there was three things in high school. I, you know, I kind of was, you know, you got to figure out what you're going to do for the mm -hmm. rest of your life. That was the mentality that you're being, you know, not that it was wrong, but it, you know, it, it's like, yeah, what, what am I going to do? And I knew it was something hunting or archery. Okay. And I, you know, for a while I was leaning more at archery. I was, I, I, uh, I went into the shop class built, uh, there was only from my memory, there was only a couple of drop away arrow rests on the market at the time. Yeah. And I go in when I turned 16, I'd go in early to the shop class and machined out and made, I still got it. An original prototype of, of a drop away arrow rest that had a fail proof spring system. Oh, that very cool. Others did. And by the time I got done engineering that, I already had picked it apart. Like, here's its faults. Here's here's mm -hmm. where it could be improved upon. I redesigned some things. I actually shot my original for a year. Um, but uh, I, by the time I got done, I was like, I don't have the capital to get this thing launched. And yeah. I don't have any cap connections. And I'm 16. And <laughs> and it just realistically, I was like, I'll come back to engineering. I, I if I was going to go to college after high school, it was going to be probably for mechanical engineering in the archery industry. That was one thing. I didn't have the money to go to college. I grew up on a small farm. Um, it was something I was going to have to float myself. Um, and also the, the way I'm wired is if I'm not interested in it, I just, I barely either passed classes or I yeah. did very well in my classes. And I, that just, that format didn't work out well for college. I knew that. So, <laughs> yeah. um, so I never went, you know, the other thing is I, I thought about and considered, uh, doing my own archery shop. I worked in an archery shop at 17, mm -hmm. um, and got enough of a taste of that to realize yeah, I don't want to be in the shop right. during hunting season that yes. much. Yep. Um, yep. It was a great experience, um, but um, but yeah, getting back to the, the so that those were the two things, and then the third that was probably my deeper what I felt was what I should do, which was produce hunting yep. films. Which at that point was um, kind of the heyday of like outdoor TV, right? I mean yeah. that that early two thousand yeah. time period. Yeah. Um, so I didn't have a video camera. I was 16 and couldn't afford one. Um, and my grandmother actually co-signed for me at Best Buy. And that first camera was a high eight. Uh, took these high eight tapes. Yep. It was 1800 and I think $52 or $53 is what it came to. It wow. had 18 months, zero interest financing at Best Buy. <laughs> and, and, uh, they had that deal and, and that's how I, I, uh, I got a pretty cool story actually, um, of the very first tape that I ever filmed. Um, maybe I'll share someday, but, uh, but it, it's a pretty cool background, background story. Um, not looking back on, on things, but, yeah. uh, there's, yeah, yeah. I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to get all those old tapes digitized and, and it's I, fun I to I think it. about that, man. Like yeah. I go back and in, into like your point of kind of the early whitetail adrenaline stuff is like, you know, there was never like a, a you know, a beginning, a, a middle a climax. It, like it didn't, it didn't ever pan out. It was just like, we were out here and then here came some deer and like, whatever we had muzzle loaders, we were shooting at them, you know, and then it just, yeah. it, it ended. Did you get them? I, you know, probably not. That's why there was nothing else afterwards. <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> so. Yeah. So, I mean, that's where my filming started. But then I, uh, y- you know, I did that for a few years. And uh, I, I don't know, probably I was 20, right around 20. 2021 and i i kind of got cold feet about my pursuit of Mm -hmm. of, you know i hadn't started i had the name um but i just i didn't want it to wreck hunting for me really yeah i I got in i I got it my head wrapped around it enough i filmed some hunts with an outdoor writer um he's since passed jeff murray yeah um He's since passed. I filmed a couple hunts with him. Um, Dan Wachurik, which was on the first dream mm-hmm. season. Yep. Um, did some filming with him. Dan's actually, I'll never forget. I got my first real camera upgraded from that was a Canon XL2. And the juries were running, you know, those oh, types yeah. of cameras. XL1S, G1s, G, uh, yep. G, G2s, was it? Can, GL2s. GL2s, yeah. Stuff like that. And I got the XL2 and all the, you know, everything. And at that time i i was just you know filming w- whatever just like you would if you didn't know what you were doing you just oh there's a turkey there's a deer <laughs> there's a, you know yeah and i'll never forget when dan wachurik after i bought that camera he said he said to me he said you know you're gonna you're gonna need to have some sort of storyline to go with mm-hmm. and that was back in 04. wow so you're gonna have, to have some sort of storyline and you know looking at hunting content back then i'd go out and film my hunts and and all you know is what you watch right Right. go out and you know you do the recreations and the you know you get this shot get that shot and i i just kind of played around with it and i I just didn't like it it was taking fun out of hunting for me with that format and so i actually gave the name whitetail adrenaline I, I uh, gave that name to somebody else about a year before. Gave it to him like, hey, if you want to use this, I don't think I'm actually going to do it. Oh, wow. Because he was talking about doing a show. And I was like, it's a great name, I think. But maybe it's not your, you know, but I was just like, I don't think I'm going to do it. I think it'll ruin it for me. Mm-hmm. So, um, and then I, I ended up... Uh, he never did anything with it and you know it wasn't like a a contract or anything like that you know uh anything there so i ended up um as fate should have it uh in 2007 my cousin jim and i we were just like uh, i think he was actually the one that just said you know jared let's let's go (laughs) just have a good time and just film whatever and and whatever comes of it comes of it <laughs> you know and, and i was like you know what i i can live with that like basically yeah. film our hunts with no format like that's not going to ru- ruin it my experience of hunting well you know what's um, funny dude is like <clears throat> obviously and it you know your just des- your description of jim saying that i can easily picture you know getting a van here and go down and just yeah. film some stuff you know but if it, to your point when you said <laughs> you know all we knew was what we were watching on tv you and yeah. I know that's not how we hunted. That wasn't that wasn't the hunts that we were doing in Wisconsin and Pennsylvania. I mean, I was doing Orange Army drives and you know banging right. deer out of you know briar thickets and grapevines, and I didn't see that on TV. Right, right, and you know, and I, how do I say this? I think for a long time. I, I did things my own way, which would work for me. Like I could still enjoy hunting. I could still be true to what hunting was for me in whichever ways that was. Mm-hmm. Like in 06, the year before I started, you know, I, 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 I that was kind of a reevaluation season. And I decided if I was going to, by the time that season was done, I decided if I was going to gun hunt for deer, mm-hmm. there's only there's basically three methods I'm going to do that. It's either tracking them, still hunting them or, or, uh, deer drives, yep. you know? And, and that's, that's just, and that's my own personal. Sure. Um, that's not for me to hold anybody else as a standard or a way that they got to, but that's how, I, what I evaluated for myself, you know, there, but you know, I, I had to do things a certain way with white tail adrenaline to keep, to keep it, yeah pure and true for me yeah you still have that passion with it yeah sometimes i've felt 
like I, I I've gotten a cold shoulder maybe at times because I, uh, you know, almost like maybe I had an agenda or something right. behind it. It's like, no, I'm just doing this. Yeah. I'm hunting on the ground because that's what I love to do. I'm doing public land because that's what I love to do. You know, that's, yeah. I love the adventure of it and all. And, mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, I, I don't like knowing everything about the deer, but a lot of my friends do. And a lot of my friends run cameras and do all that. I don't like that personally, but it's a personal thing. And mm-hmm. it's, it's not a, it's not anything that I ever tried to set a standard that all must live by and all must follow that. Sure. And it's just my own thing, you know, so. Huh. It's it's hard. I think a lot of guys don't realize, like, the barrier to entry of you know, not only being able to, like, you know, kill big or big get on big deer consistently, but that's what it takes to have, like, a successful television show. Or, or at least it did back, you know, in the, the, the time frame that we're referencing there. When you look at the Outdoor Channel and see the guys that were on there, and in hindsight, we can reflect back on it and say they either, and maybe this happened slightly after the fact, they either own and have access to like giant Iowa farms or Missouri farms or, or you know, everything in between. And they have the ability to literally capture big deer uh, on camera and, and kill them co- very consistently enough to be right. able to like, not on the side, but like, you know, hey, there's enough here to... We, you you got to produce 13 episodes. We can film it and put it on TV. Yeah. Like it's yeah. here. It's very, it's very doable. And not to take away okay. from... From no. those guys or whatever, it's doable no. to to try no. to replicate that. Friends that do that, mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. you know, and and that's their deal. And and you know, some of them have told me like, yeah, it's 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 pretty easy, but it it comes with its own set of challenges. They sure. put a lot of work in all year long, definitely. They, you know, and and that's their deal. If it, you know, I think as long as the person is having a great time and it and and it's true to them and they really enjoy it and 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 maybe five ten years down the road they kind of phase out of it on their own maybe they just kind of like you know what it's not tripping my trigger and yeah. and maybe i want to do more you know of something else and that's it's fine i mean we go through life and and well, you dude, know, who, I, who, I, who wouldn't want to be in that situation like we can all expect oh these iowa guys it's like i would love to own a thousand acres you know <laughs> that'd be amazing i don't want to take anything away from those guys at all but for guys like in our situation sitting here you know south of pittsburgh and in wisconsin and stuff to think that like i could do that you can't with the resources that you have like you we don't, I don't own a thousand acres in Iowa. I don't, we don't do that. So we, cause we kind of went through a similar thought process, Jared, even when we started, you know, Hunter, we were like, Hey, this is a portion of this is we're going to film our hunts and do this. And yeah. quickly came to the realization of how difficult that is with the re- like at the access mainly is what I'm speaking to, but the resources we have available to us. So we defaulted pretty quick, like within the first, you know, couple of weeks of, of filming hunts and stuff, we're like, it's just not great, dude. We it's it's really sucking the fun out of it for us. We, we had yeah. a very similar thought process, I think, to what you went through, and we and we landed yeah. on the podcast for us. You know that yeah. just seemed to make sense. We're like, dude, we we love to just talk it out, anyways. This mm-hmm. is like where you know this right. is our safe place. So let's just do right. that, you know. And yeah, right. And that, that that makes perfect sense. And and that's that's truthfully that's the biggest reason I never did sponsors. And and it was different back then, fifteen years ago, for sure. If you had it, you know, if you were expected to basically turn your show into an infomercial. That's it, man. Oh, absolutely. And and that's since shifted a lot. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's not so pushy anymore. And so if I were to get into the field now, you know, I maybe would consider, you know, I don't, I want to do that with where I'm at with things, but if I were a new, new person entering, you know, the field of video production in the hunting industry, I probably would select companies that I really like their products and I really believe in their products and, and they wouldn't force me to push it down people's throats and change well, my production. The, the, the guys that and, have uh, been able to uh, do that successfully, Jared, are the ones who have realized like as technology has developed, there's been opportunities to be on platforms that will, uh, like, uh, you know, uh, what's the word give give freedom to content creators so mm-hmm. essentially like the platform pays them for the content itself not for its ability to promote well, that's what i was gonna say like back in the day so youtube dvd sales yeah. you know you donnie vincent the hunting public anybody yeah. you know anybody you see on youtube you know we're, we're in that group like we we make some money from youtube and that allows right. us to sustain our you guys found apparels obviously a big one for mm-hmm. for, for guys in this niche as well so nobody back in the day nobody frankly no matter how good a content we produce would have 
would have really even looked like at us from a sponsorship side, right? Because it would have been up until five years ago, if you mentioned that you were only on YouTube, they're like, oh, listen, uh, maybe I'll give you some product, but like anybody can be on YouTube, right? Nobody realized the value of what was there. Same with what you were doing, Jared. I mean, I think ultimately like people said, oh, you're not paying $300,000 for airtime on Outdoor Sportsman Group. And, you know, I don't know. I mean, we could maybe do something, but like that's where most of our dollars are going. Right, right. And it makes sense. You know, yeah. you're hitting the masses and things like that, you know. I mean, but it changed I mean, fast. I totally, I, I totally would understand 15 years ago, like, yeah, if they're going to front me X amount of dollars, I, I understand that they need to get something in return. Sure. You know, But they figured out, I think, better methods. Yep. You know, where I think content producers can stay more true to what they want to produce and hey, here's a discount code for 10% or mm-hmm. or whatever and they, you know and they figured out better ways I think to where the production can actually stay more true to what yeah. what the the producers want it to be, yeah. you know. I mean, uh, I th- I think it was pioneered. Whereas I think back 15 years ago I felt like I got the cold shoulder a little bit mm. maybe sure. potentially from certain aspects of the industry because I, guarantee I, I, didn't you did. sponsors. I wasn't interested in sponsors and it, it's like, no, I'm not, I'm not opposing you to, yeah. to, because I am trying to, you know, create, yep. you know, whatever. I just am trying to keep hunting through to me. That's how the industry know? content world worked back then. I guarantee right. you got cold shoulders by system, going against, man. The, against the whole system. That's it's- it. That's probably how it looked like you were going against the man out there, right? Yeah. <laughs> it, it's- yeah. That's, I think that that's, you know, I, I felt like it's warmed up to me more over the years, Sure, you know, to, to where it's like, I think maybe it, it's, you know, at first I could see how it looked like, you know, I had no guides, no outfitters on the front of my DVD. You know, I was just trying to create something that was like, yeah. it wasn't like, <laughs> I mean, I had friends, uh, you know, and I still do have friends that are guides and outfitters and yep. stuff. But yep. it was like, as soon as I launched, that was the first video. The first video was a partial, some public, some by permission. Yeah. The next year uh, we launched the all public and I kept the no guides, no outfitters for two or three years. And then I was like, I don't need that on there anymore. Cause yeah. all public land pretty much says that. So, yeah. you know, it's or wild, man. I think when you go back to that time frame, so if we look at like that 2007 time frame, you, you and Jim, it's, it's you and the buddies, like you're, you're documenting yeah. how you guys hunt in Wisconsin, basically. Right. Right. That's what it is. Yep. It started more in Wisconsin, yes, in the in the timber. I, I'd like to get more into the timber again, actually. It's fun. <laughs> the prairie well, stuff is cool, but yeah, the timber stuff. In and, and again to the uh, the Michigan, the Wisconsin, the Minnesota, the Pennsylvania, like that's how we hunt it. Which right, if the industry gave you the cold shoulder, I think the public <laughs> probably was super receptive because like, oh wait, like that's it's like I was watching what I was filming on the side. That's how I hunt it. Yeah. And, and, and I don't want to point fingers and, and say the industry was sure. like that. But I sensed it, not necessar- not really from the entire, but I just I just kind of felt it. You know, and I mm-hmm. I guess I've never been to ATA and the, the industry shows, but, you know, you, 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 you're at the consumer shows. So there's other yeah. brands and companies. And, and, and that's just the general overall feeling, you know, it's uh, that I had. And and that's that's dissipated, I, I feel like quite a bit, which I think is good. Hmm. Um, you know, you, here's the thing too. I've, I've, this has crossed my mind. Like you gotta have the other side to a certain degree because I mean, if everybody hunted public land, there wouldn't be enough yeah. acreage for everybody. Exactly. You know what I mean? Yeah. You got to keep the balance. Yeah. You well, know, Hey, guess what? Of- there's not, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's not enough public land to, to sustainably yeah. for all hunters to just, Nope, you can't hunt private anymore. You have to hunt public. It would be a decimated yeah well it's also the style end of things is like you know if if i hunt whatever 80 percent of my hunting seasons on private the style that you guys do is still very appealing to to me to watch and to to see because it's like and these guys are out there really hunting spot and stock like those are the things that maybe i don't even do during that season but it's it's appealing to watch especially because it's different than what i see everywhere else sure yeah and you know and and before the videos i you know, I had some pretty good acreage in central Buffalo County, Wisconsin, that I just could hunt. I took the farmer's kid hunting and, 
and whatnot. And I, you know, there was other hunters that could hunt there, but you know, playing that private game when it came to hunting on the ground, I saved, I was very careful because otherwise you're going to blow your acres yeah. out. Right. Yeah. So it's, it's like, if I felt, you know, I did some early season, but I would be pretty careful about, about it and tiptoed. And then I'd, you know, mainly run tree stands, but occasionally get in there. But then when rut came, that's when I'd spend my time on the ground more, yep. more so on that private acreage, yeah. you know, where you're getting bucks passing through it. And, you know, but you, what I, I guess my point behind that is, is you might not, you might not, you know, guys that have say 40 acres or whatever acreage of private, they might be like, well, that, you know, ground hunting doesn't apply to me, but there might be certain times. And I've, I've, had people that have told me like yeah i cl- I saw this big buck and it was on their private ground and the, you know and and I, I climbed down from my tree stand and went and got them you know and it's yeah. like you know there is a time and a place but a private land guy may want to be a little bit more picky he might you know whereas with public land yeah we're going in there yeah. you know pretty yeah we're pretty, aggressive uh, yeah. Pretty, pretty yeah you, you know but we play you know if we get on a big one or something i mean chancey's unbelievable at it yeah. you know he's, he's you know methodical. when he gets on a big one he's he's real strategic at not blowing it out mm-hmm. just, yeah you know waiting for that right moment to slip in there the hunter podcast is brought to you by hoyt archery oh dude it's almost fall you and i are both going to be in a tree stand with brand new hoyt bows we're going to be shooting the rx7 carbon bow this year i know hoyt's <laughs> also got the venoms out both equally smooth shooting quiet bows Heck yeah, man. We got a convert on our hands this year. We got a lifelong crossbow guy with a vertical bow in his hands for maybe the first time ever, a good friend of mine. And uh, we've got them all decked out with uh, the inline accessories uh, from the QAD integrated ultra rest uh, to the quiver. And also he's got the SL sidebar mount with a couple of stabilizers from Hoyt as well. So that's going to be a six shooting bow. Yeah. And Hoyt's been cool enough that anyone listening to this can save 20% on any of the soft good apparels online using the code HUNTER, H-U-N-T-R, no E. Uh, and if you want to look at the latest lineup of Hoyt bows, check out your local Hoyt dealer. Get serious, get Hoyt. Well, dude, I think deer, deer hunting and success getting on deer every year is uh, a lot of that's about having irons in the fire. And it may not, it may not all just be on that one forty acre property. It's like you know whether or not you do get on the ground and do spot and stock stuff, or it's like there's more to deer hunting than they're just strictly managing the crap out of your forty acres in Wisconsin. And like you know, you know the, the Sturgis comes to mind. You know what I mean? The the this, the the, the hyper management. You know the staying off of it. Like there, there's a time and place for that, and it's uh you know it, it's a lot of fun. You know it's fun to to manage a piece of property and to you know ca- carefully hunt it and and you know. Uh, be targeting specific gear or stuff, but there's a lot more hunting than that too. You know, I think a lot of your guys' early DVDs like exposed a lot of us that were like in that mindset of like, this is all we do. Like we have our 140 acre, we manage the crap out of it and we hunt it. We're like, well, uh, yeah, but I could drive out to Western Kansas and, you know, buy at the time, essentially an over the counter tag and and spot and stock. Like that's totally different. That would be Mm -hmm. as a totally different experience for me. So I thought it was right. eye opening to realize like there's a lot more to just sit in a tree stand forty acres to hyper manage like there there's a whole world of hunting that you know everybody should get to experience in different capacities like you know throughout right. one season or from season to season and so yeah yeah for sure and and it comes with its own set of challenges you know I mean yeah you you go into the Western Plains and well is it still lit good I'll get another light no oh, you're fine oh to burn out on you. Yeah, I, I'm not set up, you know, I'm not because I don't have indoor lights because we don't do producer set it. You know what I mean? Like our format's all unscripted. So I got these portable lights. So there we go. All right. Yeah, you're good. Um, I got three of them though. So. <laughs> Word. That's all good. Um, uh, I, I, I was just talking oh, about I perspective on the challenges. seasons. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. That's, yeah. 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 You know, like the open plains, I mean, you got to cover ground. You got to cover yeah. ground because the, the you know, yeah, you, you know, you spend enough time doing that. Yeah. There's some massive deer in, in places like Kansas, but they're not, it's not a high density of, them. no, you're just covering enough ground. I mean, you think about it, it's like, yeah, you might put on 200 miles in a vehicle, but you, if you're looking a mile out this way and a mile out that way, yeah. that's a two mile by 200 mile stretch. You just covered 400 square miles in a day. Yeah. That's and it crazy. might take four or five days. 
to, 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 to find a big one on public, yep. Yep. you know, yep. or, or, you know, the uncuffed is, is door knock. And we finally opened up that as an option. So there you go. Um, you know, yeah, I think when we got into that, side. that side of it, it I think that side of it was kind of uh, that time frame at least was about the time where I think people started to see you could go outside of your normal state to hunt. Like for me, you know, I don't, first time I went out of state, I don't know, it was probably 24, 25, 26, something like that. Like, I mean, I never hunted outside the state of Pennsylvania. Like I didn't even know that that was even going to be a possibility for me. And then somewhere around that 2007, eight, nine time period, it was like, oh, like this is pretty easy. Like I can just go there, get a non-resident license and hunt public. And figure, you figure it out on the flight. You know, I, back in, uh, Oh four, Oh five, I took three trips uh, outside of hunting season to South Dakota. Like, cause I was like, I got to know everything about what I'm getting into and where I want to start and, and all of this. I took three trips. I, I think it was close to a decade. Maybe it was six, seven years after that before I actually ever even went to South Dakota and hunted, <laughs> you, know, you know, like, yeah. but I had taken three trips and, you know, once I, uh, started white till it, it, it's like, I didn't ever do that. Yeah. You know, it's just completely off the cuff. Just straight on out. A whim, yeah. Just yeah. straight up, you know, doing it that way. You know, and I, I found that, Hey, I, I really, it has its pros and cons, you know, in one aspect, you, you, you do that pre scouting and that premeditated and figuring things out. Mm hmm you can have a leg up, but it can also hurt you because you can become attached to old sign and old data and old yep. information and everything. Whereas like a guy coming in clear minded for yep. the first time yep. while hunting season is actually going on, he's not attached to anything. So if he gets there and it's over hunted or there's too much, you know, you know, or the sign's not there or whatever he can adapt. doesn't matter. Yeah. He goes to the next piece. There's pros and cons. You know, I think, I think ultimately a, a guy that ha has a hybrid system where, he maybe has the leg up of the, you know, maybe he runs cameras and pre scouts and does all that, but he has the ability to come in, in an instant if hunting season comes and the, the dots aren't aligning and looking right and he can feel it. He, he, he evacuates mm. and, and, you know, whereas most people, I think they keep themselves attached to that. Yeah. They hunt it. They, they try to hunt it out. Yeah. And, and the reality is, is, it's not. It's likely not going to get any well, better than you're experiencing. They're, they're polar opposites, right? Like yeah. that. That was the old world. Like back in the day, at least you know, you know, you know, from Wisconsin, it's like you had your stand. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's 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 the deer stand. I go and I sit it when it's deer season, and that's like it couldn't yeah. be more opposite from like a spot in stock. Like, hey, let's cover like you said, 400 square miles in a day and, and just get on them. Let's find what we can find. Let's, let's run well, in there, yeah, just run and gun. It's a, a total clashing of like perspectives on how you do that. I think there's a, a lot to be gained by observing, you know, both or everything in between. I know that as we've opened ourselves up to some, you know, Western styles of thinking, we've gone out and done some, you know, we've been to Kansas quite a few times and we've done North Dakota mule deer hunts, which are spot and stock to bring that back home like so you know i'd say ohio is like a core whitetail mm -hmm. state for jeremy and i without those experiences i i don't know i might still be very heavily relying on uh, you know preseason scouting trail camera information like you know whatever it is like the classic like uh put the plan together and, and go and wait in a stand yep. and honestly anymore i'm very much like i want to cover i just want to cover ground during the season as much as possible my aggression level has certainly gone up you know even on our own property you know it's just, it's just about learning just learn yeah. as much as you can i drive dude at our farm in ohio i drive those roads every chance that i get and i I like I like to joke and say that like man if I was my dad if I mm -hmm. lived here I would kill a big buck here every single year because sure. every time I go it's like there's one you know I should drive around right. yeah, look 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 here's where here's where he's coming from and all it right. all killing whitetails is about is observing observing them and and going and and hoping they do it again you know or trying to figure out what they're going to do next or get ahead of them you know it's, it's not right. rocket science right there's a lot of there's a lot of strategies to it like we were talking earlier about, okay, you got a thousand <laughs> acres. Well, doing all that stuff that you just talked about makes a lot of sense mm -hmm. because it's a lot more of a controlled environment. Like if you've managed your property, the, the, the deer have probably everything that they need. They're probably not going anywhere. You can 
really play play the game just right yeah. and and then slip in at the right moment and do it whereas like public land you don't know the next hour somebody else could show up right and blow the whole thing out so it's like you you you, you know it's a I did do, you know, more of that mainstream method back in the day. Yep. Yeah. You know, I gr- didn't grow up that way. I grew up more the style of today where it's more off the cuff and everything. But I transitioned for about four or five years, more mainstream methods at the time. Yeah. But one thing I quickly realized is going to public land, a lot of that mainstream methods doesn't work very well compared to the aggressive just For getting sure. after it you yeah know, if that kind of makes sense yeah. it does well yeah because you're not hunting deer on natural movement patterns in a lot of cases you're hunting pressure pressured deer yeah right it's right. kind of weird i kind of went the opposite i had um a, a decent amount of private access growing up you know in my teens in that early 2000 period to 2007 but i love to just be able to cover ground on public like, and I couldn't do that on my private, right? I had a 40 acre chunk. If I went in and hunted blow aggressively, out. blow it out. Right. So maybe there were better deer in that area. Maybe there were more deer in that area, but I just felt more free on the public free. side, you know, and public now in a lot of these cases is a lot different than public then, but man, you could just go and cover ground and scout and set up, you know, and, and that style, I think that style ultimately helps you kill, like you said, better on private because you were able to be out there and, you know, if you bumped or blew one spot on public, you just got in the car and you drove to the next one and hunted that one. Isn't it funny? Right. Like being from Pennsylvania, I'm going to sound pretty arrogant here, but whatever. <laughs> like, so, and you got to understand Pennsylvania has got the highest number of hunters of, of any state in the country. Yeah. Like, it always has for whatever reason. And we didn't own land growing up. Like mm-hmm. the, the, the private permission that I had uh, was exactly that it was, it was permission. So we had permission from, landowners that went to our church and stuff and like you know d- i was 12 so dad yeah. dad was obviously working those relationships and, and they were small stuff little apple orchard is the very first property that we ever hunted was i don't, it might have been a 30 acre property had mm-hmm. had a little orchard through it you'd heard you've heard me talk about we would just drive right in there and i'd walk down through there in the morning before dark and i'd peer like <laughs> just deer blowing everywhere and i'm like sounds like it's a good spot a lot of deer here. a lot, <laughs> yeah. lot of deer here <laughs> But my perception at that time of like, cause we would pass private lands like or uh, public land rather. And you'd see the signs from the very beginning. My mindset was just, that's trash. There's, there's no, like I, I would go on it. I'm like, there's no deer here. Like I just had that feeling that's o- always. Do you think that came from your dad? I don't know. I, I think it came from like, just, I knew there was a lot of hunt and maybe every time we'd drive past him, I'd see like a wall of guys in orange walking past yeah. him because we that had so it. many hunters. Oh yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I would say probably 70% of the bucks I killed before I was 24, 25 came from public land. Yeah. I, truthfully, I, I could be misremembering, but like I remember the first public land that I hunted. When you bring up the wall of orange, like what's funny is, and I mean, again, this is the change of where we are today versus that back then. I remember sitting in my stand on opening day of gun season in Pennsylvania and it'd be like 730, you know, deer movement was slow. I was begging people to get up and start moving. I was waiting for guys to start moving deer. And, and you know, now I see a guy a half mile away and I'm like, son of a bitch, <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. and it's just, it, that's it, it, changed you know, so much. Oh yeah. A hundred percent. Similar case in Wisconsin, you know, it's like, and, and a thought just came to me, you know, I've, I've, some people are against deer drives. Yeah. A lot uh, of people are, but a lot of people are, but then uh, I I've run into a, quite a few that solo gun hunt and they go set up relying oh, yeah. on that pressure. They're deer driver. They just don't know the drivers. That's it. That's it. They know <laughs> they're know, cherry like, picking. They're cherry picking yeah, those yeah, guys yeah, all the time. Yeah. So it's, it's like, you know, uh, you know, it, it is a con, you know, it's, it's maybe becoming less controversial, maybe more. I don't know. I don't get hung up on what is, Yeah. you know, the, the, the shooting at deer running and the deer drives and stuff like that. That's something that I had to evaluate back in that 06, you know, yep. I grew up doing it that way i don't think i don't think it's as prevalent Uh, it could be wrong it's interesting well i think it's probably because of the access and stuff you know what it is definitely was a hot button i think for a period of time like you shouldn't shoot at a deer running iowa has been at least in the last five years no you know what it is and it's of course i'm coming back to this but it's it's crossbows it's what it is most of the there's way less gun hunters now they're 
they're archery hunting with sure. with crossbow equipment. Yeah. So there's less there's less people to drive deer. That would make sense. There's a cultural sure. element of that. Yeah, too. there's a traditional like deer camp element that's also yeah. faded dramatically. There's still big deer drives in Iowa though. If I hear about yeah. where it happens, Iowa's got a healthy oh, yeah. a healthy driving population. Yes, they do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you got they party do. tags. Right. Yeah. I mean, right. that's a huge At least part of it. During gun season. During gun season, yeah. During shotgun, yes. Yep. Yep. Was is yep. Wisconsin party? Got to stay on top of them. You got to stay on top of them rules. And laws. <laughs> <laughs> that what 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 year was that that you guys had a little run in there, Jared? Oh yeah. That would have been 2016. 2016? Yeah. I had I had two Two back to back, boom, boom. Wow. Yeah. What was it? Yeah. One of those was from mapping software, correct? You, bo- both, both actually were. were. Yeah, they kind of leveraged well, the 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 one in Minnesota. I I'd been doing this a long time, and and I should have done a little more background, you know, investigative work on it. But I had gotten pretty comfortable with the the software. Mm-hmm. Um. And I didn't. And we hunted the piece three times in a four day period. The third time I was like, something don't feel right here. We got to call and, you know, if we're going to hunt, hunt this. We got to, we got to dig on this. Something just doesn't feel right. So we did. Um, and it checked out from the state that it was actually newly acquired public land. And that was a state official. Mm-hmm. And I, the, the muzzleloader season had ended there. Okay. I went to Nebraska. I was, I got to Nebraska and I got the confirmation that that approved. It was kind of weighing on me. Like, dude, did we screw up? You know, it was weighing heavy on me. And I got the confirmation about 45 minutes before a similar (laughs) deal in Nebraska happened where it's like, you know, it's marked as public on this, on this software. And, and, I got the confirmation that no, we had nothing to worry about. We're good in yep. Minnesota. So I was like, okay, all right. Yeah. It's, it's been very legit and you know, the software and everything. So you, you keep saying the software is the Onyx or like constant. It, it was Onyx, but yeah. you know, I mean, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, they, you know, I obviously I learned a lot through investigating it all, mm-hmm. you know, that they get the information from the state, which yep. comes from the County generally and the, gis and yep you know tax map basis so Mm -hmm. so what threw me off on nebraska was i was aware you can't hunt uh the school lands in nebraska some states you can like north dakota unless they've changed something north dakota you can well they i had seen it i was in a different part of nebraska and normally on on x at that time they had the the uh what from what i had seen they had a marked as school lands well i was in a different part of nebraska and it said state of nebraska so it wasn't designated (laughs) well in deeper digging into it that particular county and some other counties as i got to looking in nebraska the whoever the gis person was at that county decided to call it state of nebraska and not school lands and so that's why onyx had it labeled that way right well anyways i ended up shooting a buck on one of those which ended up getting, uh, you know, warden got called out there and, and the buck got taken away and he, he, he saw everything that I had there and everything. And he, and he was real, you know, he had to give me a ticket for it, but he took the deer and, you know, it was, you know, all, all pretty well squashed on that, but Mm -hmm. the whole Minnesota deal, that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother debacle because that was, that was some corruption. So that came back um, clean, right? Minnesota official basically said, "Yep, you're right, man. We that's recently acquired public land." Yeah, yeah, that's what he said. So at, you thought you were time. good? Yes. And yes. then that turned out not to be true. That t- turned out not to be true and I knew something was up when we went what you know, so, so what happened is is Minnesota had found CWD. Yeah. In that during that muzzleloader hunt. So they opened up a a CWD hunt in early January. Okay. So we had a few of us had Iowa muzzleloader tags. We went to Iowa, we cleaned house in four days. We shot three bucks. You know, we went three for three on that. And the next morning we went over to Minnesota for the CWD hunt. (laughs) And I had shot a buck the day before I was the last one to fill my tag. (laughs) And we had, uh, we went over there to Minnesota like, Hey, let's hunt that piece. And, and a few other pieces, 
you know, and we're, we're out there hunting. My brother-in-law was doing a drive, you know, we're back in this piece and warden walks up to me in the woods and, you know, he's all, you know, pretending to be my friend kind of thing, but you know, you're, you're trespassing, but I'm like, no, we're not, you know, my brother-in-law will be coming. We'll go back to the vehicle. We'll get it all straightened out, you know? Mm-hmm. And so we walked the three quarters of a mile back to the, well, as I come around the corner, I see somebody's vehicle all stickered up. So, uh, you know, another, whatever. I don't, I don't, I did at the time, I didn't know like what, what was going on. And then there's four wardens there. Whoa. You know, well, mm. well, uh, yeah, that it was, uh, it's pretty well, you know, it's in that good, bad, ugly <laughs> yep. video for anyone who wants to watch it. But, you know, I mean, it, it, it could have been a lot worse than it ended up being. Um, and, and there, there was a lot of things that should have been done on the other side. There's, there's some things that I should have done on my side, you know, a little bit better digging on mm-hmm. some things. Yeah. You but know, I mean, I you called somebody and an official said, yeah, you're good. I mean, how many right. times? I, I mean, I mean, when we initially, you know, went, you know, hunting that we should have done a little bit more digging, but once, you know, it was totally on us. It's not like somebody put a sign up there, like, sure. you know, that threw a red flag. We just, there was a few things that just didn't feel right. You know, and it was totally a decision on our part. Like, we, we you know, we weren't trying to jib jive anybody or anything. And I mean, mm-hmm. that was pretty obvious if you looked at all the information. Yeah. You know, but, but yeah, essentially we got lied to by a state official uh, that was working with a game warden. And, and one of the game wardens was a new game warden. So I'm sure they were looking to make a career out of, you know, <laughs> do this big bust. And then when, once everything dropped, it was like, yeah, you don't actually have what you thought. You know, maybe they thought for a little while that, you know, it was something bigger than what it was and, and they were going to make his career out of it or, or, you know, whatever. I mean, do you think that they targeted you to make an example of who you guys were? That's what, that's what all the evidence suggests that. Wow. Yeah. That that's what they're going to do. Was that, was that, you know, and I, I, I've seen, you know, there's a lot of great wardens obviously out there, Sure. you know, and we got, we got to have them, you know, and I, I seen another corruption, you know, and that's in the video on the ride with uh, Chansey. Yeah. That, that was a complete joke you know, what, what happened there, that hunting a refuge deal that, that, (laughs) that'll make you want to rip a guy's badge right off his chest for, for, I mean, I mean, there's no reason why that individual should be a, a state warden. Absolutely not. Not when you look at all the evidence of everything. You hear it a lot, man. It's unfortunate. You've got a mark from the state DNR as public hunting. You've got no no signage out there. A couple of buoys in flooded timber, three quarters of a mile wide stretch of water. You know, three buoys in a cluster like it's marking something in the water. I'm supposed to motorboat up to that. Like that's, you know, 150 yards if you walk off the bank is this hidden sign calling it a refuge. Like, come on. Get 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 real. Oh, you know? That's crazy, like, man. Get the hell out of here. Yeah. You know? wow. Well, so. <laughs> I mean, that's what it comes down to. Is you're right. There are a lot of good wardens out there. We've talked to plenty yes. of them, but there's some that I, you know, I don't know. I don't. I don't know what it is. But and I mean, those are the ones that give all the other ones a terrible rap. I mean, nobody sure. wants to see a game warden. You know, they could be really good. I, 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 I like. I like running into them. <laughs> you know, it's an interaction for my video. You yeah. know. Yeah. I, so, you know, I, I did you they know, give you an issue that. filming them? Cause I mean, no, you guys they, got they, the they camera can't. running. Yeah, they, they can't. can't, they can try, but they can't. Right. I mean, legally they can't. I right. mean, if they have something and they want to seize your, your equipment, you know, if they actually have something, they can do that, but they can't just make you stop recording. They can tell you to, but you don't have to listen to them. Interesting. You know, they don't want to be recorded. And I, <laughs> obviously I found out with Minnesota. Yeah. yeah you, you, you know, there's some things there that, uh, yeah, the, like obviously, you know, my mic had cut out, so I didn't have my conversation, mm-hmm. you know, the range. Well, of course, they didn't submit the recorded conversation I had with that warden. Mm-hmm. You know, that they he, either he chose not to record that conversation or right. chose not to supply it. For yeah, chose reasons. to admit it. Huh. Well, right, right. So, so what ha- what happened with that Minnesota deal? Like, did the, I well, they, 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 they got from, a hold of the state you know, rap thought, after, and then he you well, said he lied. So they went back well, to him. Yes, 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 yes. Of of course, you're dealing with the state, which is very powerful, right? Mm-hmm, right. You know, so you know, uh, it would have cost me a lot of money to go back and 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 sue them. The big thing with it is I didn't want to lose our hunting rights, which sure. I caught wind that that's what was going to happen. You know, yeah. petty fine, petty fine. You know, 
Um, but lost a license. Know, but lost a license for two or three years. I caught wind wow. of that. And so, yeah, I had to get some attor- attorney help involved to make sure that that, you, you know, which is just totally absurd. Yeah. When, when you looked at everything, it was totally ridiculous. Well, and it's so, money out of your pocket for yeah. basically a frivolous charge. Right. Right. It should have never happened. It should have never happened. There should have been a sign up there. They had issues with, you know, it was marked wrong on the software all year. There was other people. I mean, I had a guy come up to me at a show and he, he, he pinned the piece right to the piece and, and, and said that he had called the warden on that too. And he had hunted it. So, <laughs> you know, and I had heard that multiple people had hunted that afterwards. Sure. And, and, uh, you know, so somebody had leased that ground. And, you know, they should have, in my opinion, put a sign up there if they had issues. Absolutely. You know, like, hey, Why would you wrong? not? You know, right, right, right. If you had so, issues, I don't want anybody on it. I'm going to make sure there's an apparent sign so right. nobody isn't in there. Right, right. There, there was a sign on the corner post, but it was angled towards the other property, you know. And, and, you know, there was rumors going around that, oh, there was a sign up. Well, that, which obviously the wardens took pictures of stuff and they didn't supply the picture of that photo, but they put it in the written text. So it's their word, you know, and it's like, uh, that sign is clearly pointed, you know, over here. So, which there's a reason that you didn't take a picture of it, (laughs) you know, like, oh, I mean, that's the stuff, you know, these are the incidences that, uh, and I don't know how familiar you are with it, Jared, or you heard us earlier talking about C.J. Alexander's buck in Ohio that's been seized. It's like, you know, some of C.J.'s story surely seems suspicious. But then you see the kind of tale of the tales of what, how these corruptions and kind of backdoor type stuff has happened, and you have to question it. And, you, you know, yeah. maybe they're out to get them. Maybe they're well, trying to well, make an example. I, I I do understand it, you know, like if if you know if if, if I was a, a warden, it's like you know if you're looking at certain things without having all the full sure. full evidence, it's like you you kind of probably at times have to go off your gut instinct, and and it's like oh the, we got some guys filming out here, and you know uh, and maybe it looked that way from the outside, but you know the way some things were done there should have never happened. And, and at the end of the day, it should have all gotten dropped yeah. immediately, you know? So, um, hmm. you know, I, you know, I found out that the warden was well aware of what was going on with that parcel hmm. all, all season long. He was well aware of it. He, he should have had the, the decency to, to let the guy know that the, the guy that was complaining the least. Absolutely. Property, right? To, to at least put a sign up there rather than entrap people. Yeah, that, at, at and that's minimum. exactly what it was. Did you guys, you know, I know back at that time, obviously this is prior to like what Warb and these guys are doing on hunting public and yeah. stuff. Did you guys have a lot of um, issues with public land and the quote filming for profit side of things? No, no, I really didn't because nobody was really doing it back then. Got it. You know, you know, I mean, nobody was really doing it back then. And then one thing, you know, um, I, I, I've heard a few of the snippets. I didn't, I didn't for a while. Um, but I heard, uh, the, uh, which, what's his first name? Ranella, um, Matt or Steve, Matt, Matt, Mm -hmm. I heard that he had some controversial points on that, you know, um, because they were set up originally from like a Hollywood standpoint, right? Like you can't, this Hollywood film set can't go up and set up on public land and, and film right. and then obviously turn into a video for millions of dollars. But that quickly, yeah. there were, I, I remember reading about two or three specific cases on you know, guys who I would say weren't really doing it for profit, but like more of a hobby type thing, but they were filming and then they were whatever, they were making YouTube videos or TV shows or whatever. And, and the states were cracking down on them pretty tough. Yeah, well, Missouri for a long time, and I think they took it off, and then they put it back on for a long time. You couldn't film on public lands or or the state public lands, yeah. I think is what it was. And maybe it still is. Maybe it went back to that. I can't remember. Um, but, yeah, you know, uh, as far as that goes, I, I mean, 
if you go back 15 years ago, there's a lot of people complaining because there wasn't public land content out there. Right. You know, and, and, you know, I mean, it's funny to watch how, you know, people shift their viewpoints on things like 15 years ago, they're complaining about all these TV shows and no public, you know, it's this, you know, a lot of privatized land. And then, you know, you, you, you go 10, 15 years later and it's like a lot of public land content out there. Now, now it's like, you're you know, burning my spots. You're, you're burning my spots. I'm all, I've always been this way since long before the videos, I'm trying to get in and out of places. It, it's something my dad ingrained me with. Mm -hmm. it, you get in and you get out without anybody knowing. Right. That's what you do. Because as soon as you kill a big buck on public land. Yeah. Toast. You know, and somebody knows about it. Done. It's everybody else attaches they oh yeah. that guy shot that big one there that one time you know yep. and, and you know now looking back on it you know selfishly i was doing it to preserve it for me but from the grand scheme of things now i look at it and i'm like you know it preserves the the public land for other guys that have put in the effort too yeah it somebody else could come in there effort. and I can, yeah i have the ability you know to to to, hey, this spot got blown out. I'm going to drive two hours to another spot or another part of the state. But the local guy that gets off at four o'clock from work, right. he doesn't have that ability. And so I can see how he'd get pissed off. So, you know, if I can get in and out of an area and kill one deer in a year, it doesn't, it doesn't really wreck it for, for yeah. the area. So, you know, which is why I've been very careful blurring things out in the videos and stuff like that. Because <laughs> you guys have I done that from the get go. Yeah. You know, yeah. trying to avoid landmarks and things like that. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. And I mean, there's most certainly been some that have been picked up, you know, uh, along the way. But, but, well, did uh, we, uh, we had Matt on the podcast and, and we talked <laughs> through that for hours, you know, and I, you know, after all of that, I can appreciate Matt's perspective. I, yep. I refuse to be okay with, uh, you know, sh shaming, hunters basically f for promoting what, what we love, you know, whether it's public land or it's, you know, uh, blatant spot burning aside. Cause like, I think we're all on the same, but nobody, nobody's trying to do that. Like, Hey, no. here's, right. here's the coordinates, right? Here's right. That, that, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's nobody's intention there. The reality right. is that technology has come like, uh, you know, we mentioned Onyx earlier, like, dude, I don't, right. Between Which that, they got, they got way better after all that. You know, I think they probably maybe had some influence. I, I noticed that Nebraska, you know, those lands changed. So, oh, dude, I mean, Onyx so, is, that like is that. the reason. Well, it's back like, in it, 2016, I mean, Onyx was not widely used, was very, you know, still pretty infantile in, in what its availability and people in, compared to yeah. now where, I mean, dude, find, a, find a legitimate hunter who doesn't have it on their phone. You know? Yeah. Right. One, it was, right. it was born out of necessity as guys were buying and leasing, you know, a lot of the good, you know, private lands, more and more guys were right. turning towards public land. And at the same time, a resource that shined lights in the corners of every piece of public land to say, here it is, right. here's everywhere I can go. Right. I can pull it right up on my phone. I can walk out to it, see right. where I'm at in relation to property lines. And like, right. oh, holy cow, all of a sudden it's well, like a big world got real small, yeah. real quick. Right. And you know, as far as that goes too, you know, you know, I, I requested when I got into that deal with minnesota i i requested multiple times from onyx i need the information that you got from the gis department at that county mm -hmm. you know at, which i never got for mm. whatever reason but i didn't put this together until the case had closed and finalized and it was when i was doing the final editing because i needed certain information i figured out where the glitch happened on the gis part there was a state walking trail that bordered the property and that got marked with mm. that property. That's how it got marked wrong. Got it. And if I would have had that piece of information, that's what I needed. Yep. That was where, so that's, basically that parcel just got overlapped into it. Into yes. The marking. Yes. That's, that's how that ever got marked wrong in the first place is that wow. state trip. Cause I was clicking on the GIS. I was clicking on the GIS and at that time that county, you, you know, most companies are free GIS pages, but at yep. that time that county charged something like 200 bucks or something like that. Really? To access their GIS. Yeah. Yeah. Cause oh. I went on there before I ever walked on the property to try to check it and, and I couldn't get access to it. And well, I didn't think of it at the time. My cousin Jim is a land surveyor. Well, he just so happens he's able to get access to that. Mm -hmm. And so in light of it, I eventually got access to that GIS, but 
everything had been settled by that point, but that's right. what I found there. Jeez. So. Man, it would surprise me if Onyx has not, you know, either been or currently in a pile of lawsuits. Oh, they have. Whether from I landowners mean, well, or from... Probably why, and that's probably statement. why they didn't want to supply me with that yeah. information. Sure. They were you have to subpoena it. When, when it wasn't really about them. You know, yeah, I was, you know, upset because that's what I used. I was a little bit, like, disturbed, you know, like, what the heck. But once I wrapped my head around how the a- information transfers from where they get it and everything and connected the dots, it was like... Yeah, I, I can see how that would get missed. Well, and it's the there. trickle effect is that like for so like my place in Kentucky. So I've, I've got a spot in eastern Kentucky, Jared, that if you look at uh, Onyx, like my property lines are way off. But it's also because like the last time there had been a survey on that parcel was like 1875, you sure. know, and this oak tree existed and this rock existed and this fence existed. So like until that new um boundary marker is accepted by the county gis it won't convey to onyx so like a lot of times like if i our lease that we had down there mm-hmm. i mean remember the and he was a warden he's the county warden he had to draw the boundary and he's like no don't even pay attention to onyx it's so off here's what the actual property is i'm like how the hell is it that wrong yeah when in other places it seems like i mean it's damn it's damn close You're talking about the lead well, maybe- Talking maybe about the, the lease you flipped the ranger on? Yes, yeah. the lease I flipped the ranger on. Okay, cool. <laughs> yeah. Maybe maybe the, maybe the maybe the warden hunts there too. Yeah, you know, we, we we ran into that. That's very into possible, that. man. Absolutely. Hey, you see a spot that looks real we, good we, right we, here? The we line actually comes out and around Colorado that. Deal. <laughs> You're in Colorado? Yes, yes. Yeah, with elk. Yes. What yes. happened? <laughs> so uh What's it, what um, are you saying? What happened in Colorado? Well, we didn't get in any trouble for it. You know, this is the year before Tanner ran into this. You know, the, you know, shot an elk on public. It ran across the line and then it was a big fiasco. Mm-hmm. It was dead. He, he, I think he could see it from, you know. Wow. And the warden told him, you know, he found out the warden hunted there. And, you know, and uh, so they were real careful with it the next year. Like they were, if you watch a disc feature three of uncuffed, they go back the next year. Tanner was solo that first year, but go back and they were talking about like head shooting the elk if they needed to, to make Just sure, to make sure it didn't get across the, the damn line. Well, <laughs> Ethan, you know, shoots a six by six in the lungs and going off of their onyx, uh, it was, he had a, like 150 or something. I can't remember. It's, it's in the video. It, wow. it had a quite a bit of, room there to work with well the elk ended up dying 20 yards or so on the other side of the line and he couldn't go get it he couldn't go get it until he walked off the mountain he didn't have enough service to make a call so he had to hike off the mountain which was a fiasco from their location it's a day out and you know go through that whole hula blue and and on the map it actually showed the elk was on public but he's got to go off the fence line right yeah you know he's got to go off the fence line but he by the map yeah he's good to go he's good but, to go. you know um and i mean i think we can all agree 90 percent of the dudes who are not filming are walking across and bringing that some bitch back was that was that the <laughs> warden was not allowing you guys to go get it or well he the year before he 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 told tanner if this happens again you're not going across that line to get it yep yeah so the, the no, precedent it's like what the precedent you, you had been made at that point guys you're gonna waste the whole animal let it rot you're a warden Come on. Yeah. Well, at least Come on. he let him get it the first year. He let him get it the yeah. first year, but he told he made it a point to tell him, like, yeah. if it goes across the line next year, you're not well, you yeah, truth, it. truthfully, we, we've done it. I, it's not like a one year standard, but like we have, uh, we have some Amish that border us in Ohio, and it's like, I mean, dude, like <laughs> every couple of days they're calling us, like, hey, where'd deer run across, run across? And, and I understand you can't control where a deer runs after, but at some point, you do have to draw the line to say, like, hey, listen, like, back off the line. If they're running that far, like, something's got to change something yeah yeah mm-hmm. right no I, I i get it you know i i, I mean well we also know just, those those landowners cheat those fence lines like let's be well, it, let's be honest yeah in that particular case it, it does appear that that's been cheated which you know mankind will always try to not all but most of it will try to take what they can for if, sure if they can get away with it so. yep yeah that's oh. crazy man I just not to go back too far, but like, is there a clear path to becoming a warden? Like, who? Oh yeah. 
where, who are these guys? Like, where, where do they, do, are, mo- are most of them like, they want By the to- way, there's a lot of great ones too. You know, yeah. I've got some friends yeah, you that, that are, you know, I mean, <laughs> yeah. they're, you know, <laughs> well, I, I, call- I don't want this to come across the wrong way. No, you no, know? no. You know, I we talked need- to, what, two or three of them um, <laughs> when I shot that buck and it went up on that property. Similarly, I couldn't, I didn't have permission to go get it. So I wanted to use a thermal drone to, to find it. Similarly. Similarly. I think it's the word. Yeah. Similarly. Yeah, that's what I said. Uh, but I wanted to use a thermal drone. So mm-hmm. I called two wardens. They were cool with me. Mm-hmm. One basically said, no way in hell. Like, don't do it. Mm-hmm. Like, well, we're gunning for people that are doing that. Mm-hmm. The other one was like, yeah, I get it. You know, and it's kind of dependent on who's in your area. It's a gray, well, it's and, a gray and area. And they are at the discretion of, you know, whatever they have, the law, you know, the law. And which, if, it, if the law is, is gray. gray. Yeah. You know? So that's not their fault. No, it's not. And obviously we found out whatever two weeks later, like dude got busted for it and like in a big sting operation. So I'm glad I didn't do it in retrospect, but. Yeah, so it could have been you. <laughs> yeah, it could have been me. But I mean, those, you know, when you get into those situations, like I've definitely had my fair share of run-ins with, you know, um, with wardens who, whether they hunt an area or, you know, have, uh, relationships with landowners around certain places that, you know, not that it's ever turned into anything big, but like you get the gist, like you, they don't want you there. Recently? You run into any recently? Uh, it's been quite, quite Kansas. some time for me. You have in Kansas? Yeah. Like three years ago, three or four years ago. When, was I there? I think so. Or maybe it was the year you weren't there. I was on public scouting uh-huh. and like, I didn't, I was done. I tagged out and, but I was just scouting some areas and I was, yeah, I was right along private line but i was on the public side mm-hmm. and yeah i just happened to run into the guy there and i tried to make small talk and he he was not having it um what was he looking for uh, he was patrolling what i don't know huh. that he said he was patrolling the public but i could tell that he hunted the private he's like have you seen some chinese guys from wichita's hunting squirrels <laughs> they're way <laughs> deep they're way deeper at this point yeah, yeah. i said you got to keep going yeah, brother they they're way going. in there yeah he just he just didn't and I, again i was i was like yeah i'm just scouting uh, you know my buddies are still tag have tags and like you know if we find some good spots i might bring them over and he's like oh you know a lot of guys hunt over here like he's like you know i just i just try to watch you know this landowner's pretty particular about the fence lines and stuff and i was like yeah like clearly, how much you want to bet he had permission to hunt there i'm sure private. he did yeah i'm sure he did so yeah and i mean i don't know those are the ones that are tough like you, you it's a it's an abuse of power right that's what it comes yeah. down to yeah to to yeah yeah some of them have that you know it's um i've got a real good friend he he was he's a retired warden at the state of minnesota ironically for 30 <laughs> years so i looped him in when all this happened um and and i've i've got to hear his side of of different things on you know in that field and 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 he told me you know as he was retiring he he's seen a, a quite a bit more of that abuse of power and not mm. actually you know not reading between like you know what is and what isn't just trying to nickel and dime guy sure. he's seen more of that that mm. And, uh, I, I mean, it, I, I could tell it kind of sickened him a bit and, and, uh, you know, I've thought about it too. You know, I, you know, it's like you hear these petty cases of, Oh, you took a photo without having your tag on it first. And it's oh, like, yeah. you know, if I was a warden, I wouldn't be paying too much probably attention to the social medias because nothing heavy, you know, it's like the real violating poaching and things, Absolutely. The heavy stuff. who's going to be posting that out there. You're, you're looking for petty crap. Yeah. Like, yeah, you the, know, that's it's the like big go one. do some undercover work. Go go do some heavy stuff. Like quit trying to well, nickel I, and dime guy that forgot his to put his tag on and did three minutes later. Like the pet on, peeve dude. one I see here in Pennsylvania because we have antler restrictions is I've I've heard plenty of cases of guys, you know, let's say they shot a four point and they thought it was a six point. And they they do the right thing. They tag it, they then call the game commission and turn it in get on the ground <laughs> yeah and they basically get the book thrown at them and it's like well, really? well yeah that's a good point i mean oh, yeah. when i was in minnesota they put that four point antler restriction you know i i don't know how many you know small bucks i walked up to that were double lunged right through the line yeah, they just left them it, they left them yeah because because you know like oh shit he doesn't have four points we were told we were at told. one point that it was like a 25 dollar fine to, that if, if you if you shot one that didn't meet the antler restrictions you turned it in it was like a 25 dollar fine that got thrown out pretty quickly 
Um, in fact, I've, a couple people I, I think mean, lost I mean, like that's I think I think something small like that's reasonable, but I think you know it creates such a fear with people like, oh, that's I'm going to exactly lose my hunting it. privileges for two, three years because I didn't know that it didn't have four points. You know, it's yep. like so they leave it lo- rot in the woods. So what are you going to do? You're going to you know, yeah, you know, the ecosystem will clean. Well, it I mean, up dude, just be on, I mean, be crazy. be honest, like, dude, if if I think I'm going to lose my hunting license versus I shot a four point, I'm leaving it. Sure. Yeah. yeah, I'm I mean, not losing my again, license. No, if that. you tell me if I bring it out, I, gonna, I would much rather call it in and just admit the mistake and pay the fine. Yeah, you're going to give me a twenty five dollar right. fine and take the deer and yeah. like whatever. Do hunter sharing the heart? Great. Here's twenty five bucks. I'm sorry, didn't mean to do it. But yeah, the, or even a hundred or whatever. Yeah, that you know, fear. I mean, reasonable. That fear you know? is what's keeping people from doing that. It's also the fear that's giving the stereotype to every warden out there, no matter if they're good or not. Well, I, I think right. that uh, a lot of like what we see there with them picking on petty stuff on social media and stuff is that the, the reality is they're significantly outnumbered or, you know, you could say understaffed, but like, what is there, one warden covering yep. multiple counties in a yeah. lot of cases? Like there's only, you know, a few dozen yeah, per true. per state type or a few sure. hundred or what, you know, whatever yeah. that looks like, but there's just no possible way that they could address every single game violation. So like... I think those guys find themselves like wanting to take on like, you know, look, looking for the white whale that they can um, have a big impact with. They're like, man, yeah. if, I can, if I can catch one guy that's well known for doing something, regardless of what it is, that's going to have a better, a bigger impact. But yeah. for the hunting population, it's like in Pennsylvania, I talked to that the warden the other day and he was like, you know, I think 90 percent of the guys that are baiting illegally in the state of Pennsylvania, like we we just miss. We have no idea. Sure. And it's like, that's an issue. Like, but there's other things that are frankly lower hanging fruit that they can sink their teeth into. Mm-hmm. And so it's like, okay, yeah. well maybe that's good for, you know, the commission and to make a mark, but like, there's a major factor here that's affecting all the hunters in Pennsylvania that aren't, isn't getting addressed. Yeah. Well, and it's tough too. Cause you, yeah, you can't just go, well, maybe they can, they can just go on to private property. I think they can. I mean, I, I, that's very unclear to me, but it sure seems like they can just walk onto your property and say, Hey, I need to check your license. Yeah. Yeah. From my understanding, they, they can do that. Yeah. They yeah. have the power to do that. Yeah. yeah. And I think at that point they're there for more than just checking your license. I think if they're just most of the time, I think, yeah, if, if they're cross, if they decide they're going to, cr- you know, do something like that, they got probably a decent amount of information, you know? Yeah. I think most of them operate that way. You know, it yeah. just depends on the individual. But yeah, I mean, our buddy Mike has had a, a pretty significant run in with those guys. Yeah, and we don't know the story. We know Mike's story. We don't know the other side, right? We have a, yeah, yeah. He, and he just got checked on private land the other day. I'm yeah, I'm, I don't know. I don't know the law on that. If they can just come onto your land uh, without like a, uh, I'm pretty sure they can. That's bullshit. <laughs> I'm pretty sure they can. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. It's, it's a two edged, like, out of, this is coming out of my mouth. It's like, I, I, I want those guys to have every resource to be able to, yes. uh, what's the word? Not prosecute, but, uh, act patrol. on, act on the law yeah. Pat- patrol. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But also, you know, respect of privacy. Yeah. yeah. L- landowner rights too. Yeah. Right. It's a very gray area anymore. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, very good. Yeah, it's all kind of out out of control. It's uh, dude, technology is just evolving so quickly. Like I just, uh, I'll even even sympathize with lawmakers. It's like how, how could you possibly you keep up with it? Like you know, thermals, drones, cellular cameras. Like I mean, you can't keep up with any of this stuff mm-hmm. anymore. New weapons, new dates, right. new tech, new mapping technologies, different yeah. line line discrepancies. Especially on multiple states. Oh my god, <laughs> multiple know, states. Man. Yeah. Well, hey, we, read the rule book. <laughs> Well, that's the thing, dude. We so we uh, Jared and I bought a farm in Illinois this past year. When we were out there scouting, we had an incidental run in with our neighbor, and you know it it was what it was. And you know maybe we were a little out of the line. He was for sure out of line. But well, what, well, here's what it was. We we hung a stand on so inside of our fence there is a is a bullpen. We call it the bullpen. The the owner that we bought it from had built this uh, interior fence to to house bulls. It's like a secluded part of the farm. Mm-hmm. So we hung a stand that was on that fence thinking that it was inside of our property line. Again, used Onyx to reference like where the true line was at and stuff. And uh, so that's where it was. And there were two fence lines. He's claiming that that fence line is actually his when that's why I think he's out. Anyways, the the thing that came out of that is like, um, he's like, I just want you guys to know why he was so adamant is that there's a 50 yard. Was it yard? I don't know. 50 yard or 50 foot. Yeah. 
uh, law of which you cannot hunt along a fence row to another private landowner without written permission in the yards, state. Of, 50, yards. 50 yards. Well, immediately it was like, holy shit, dude, that renders this entire farm worthless. Yeah. We're like, <laughs> I that, probably wouldn't have bought this farm if that was yeah. the case. And so we called the warden, the local warden, and I was like, hey, like, you know, uh, we're trying to find this online. Like, we can't find it. This, this neighbor is very adamant about it. Um, in fact, somebody else, I think, brought it up to us, too. And he, he was like, no, he's like, that got brought up in 2010. It did, never made it anywhere. But if you look it up you online, it. it does come up, but it says it was tabled. Like, it doesn't say that it was passed. But this guy who was from Chicago literally thought that that was a law. And he had every angle on us to basically say your farm's worthless <laughs> that you just bought. And we didn't know, right? We're coming from Pennsylvania. We're like, holy well, shit. Well, so that was our law? opportunity to actually say, you know what? We know the warden, and that's actually not a law. So here you go. Here's you can yeah. use this moving forward. Right. Yeah. And but then, that, that's the kind of stuff that's floating out there that, you know, people like him are still using against his neighbors. And, you know, some people may not have the guts to call the warden and say, hey, is this a law? You know, and they may hunt the rest of their life thinking there's a 50 yard buffer against that fence. That, line. that is the move. I mean, if you're at all concerned, like, you know, or guys in our position like that, that should be your first call. It's ca just call the warden, introduce yourself, yeah. you know, tell them if you're going to be hunting there a lot, you know, have have a relationship there. I mean, you, those guys are good people for the most Your part, call so. to Minnesota was not to a warden, though, right? Or was? No, we we were directed by the warden to this. To state. call and that we, person. We my bro When I say we, my brother-in-law made the contact. Got it. Got he it. contacted the person they told the, you to the warden, the warden gave him that, that, uh, and, and he also contacted the state headquarters and got that name as well. Wow. So. The Hunter podcast is brought to you by Muddy and Stealth Cam trail cameras. Cell cams, cell cams, cell cams. What an evolution the industry has seen. And we've experienced personally over the past five, 10, you know, whatever cameras were invented, right? It's like, man, it's totally changed the way that we inventory deer, pattern deer, and ultimately the decisions that we make when we're going out to hunt. They're a serious piece of the puzzle. And, and uh, you know, that information is invaluable for us. We trust the Muddy and Stealth Cams, you know, together to be able to, to collect any of that information. Yeah, I mean, as an admitted trail cam addict, you know, I've definitely been guilty of of under hunting places or relying too heavily on that information that's come in that said it's an invaluable tool to the overall management plan and strategy that i have for my own properties or even hunting public land it doesn't yeah. matter we have a finite amount of time in going out and hunting so when you and i are after a particular class or quality of deer usually a mature buck we can't waste time hunting an area where that deer doesn't exist. And those cell cams provide that information that allow us to spend the time in the area with the highest chance to accomplish our goals. I say it all the time, man. They can't kill them if they're not there. That's it. So right now, any of our listeners can use uh, code HUNTER20 to get 20% off either Muddy or Stealth cameras. Uh, we're certainly going to be taking advantage of that, and we hope you guys do too. Yep, check out Stealth Cam and Muddy. Crazy, man. So, and that's the thing is like, um, you know, as as access is continuing to get strangled here, you know, I mean, it's not even a fraction of what it was 10 years ago in a lot of cases. Like, and you're, you're jamming more people into these public land areas and everybody has onyx and they're looking for these kind of hidden gems. I think yeah. you're going to have more of this stuff continue to rear its head. Well, y yeah, you know, and, and not to be, you know, bring that back up, but you know, I said well, a, a person came to a show and, and told me they had hunted that ground and and uh two yeah and had called the warden and he brought up the warden's name and he had bow hunted it earlier before we had been there and he his report from that warden was no that's wrong that's not right on that map hmm. no that's not what the warden told us wow hmm. he said i don't know that parcel that's the excuse me that's what he said. He didn't refer this guy's name. I, as my memory is now getting clear on that, he didn't refer this guy's name at the state who he'd have to contact. My brother-in-law then contacted the state headquarters. That's the name that he got. That's the name he that got. Guy was, that guy had already had conversations with that warden regarding this. Mm. So essentially, yeah, just a bunch of diabolical lying <laughs> kind, of, kind of thing. Crazy, man. You know? You, you, you know, but it, it was a bit disturbing when, when, when I'm told by this other hunter that he had hunted that with a bow and identified the exact parcel. And before we had ever stepped foot on that property, this is what the warden told him. And so he had no issues. And, and he had told the warden I hunted it and it just doesn't seem right. 
and the, the warden told him clearly and plainly, yeah, that's that's not right. That is private. And that's, what, that's not what the warden told us. What didn't make – you said whatever. It was the third time. You, at some point, you got a feeling that it was like we aren't supposed third to time. be here. What, 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 what triggered that feeling, do you think? There was – on that particular parcel, we noticed some double-set stands and trail cameras – there was two or three or something I think we came across that didn't have locks on them. Oh, yeah. You know, I've seen trail cameras on public that don't have locks on them. I've seen double set tree stands. Yeah. You know, that that, that was the He's main... like, I've seen them in the back of my truck. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. You know, and obviously we never took any property or anything. Sure. I mean, that's who we are. You know, we're not going to you know, be scoundrels saying that it was uh, double set. Jared, you know, was it like somebody filming for hunts that at least yeah, yes. that's what he means. Yes. That's what it turned out to be. Yes. Oh, interesting. So that person yeah. was super pissed. Yes, they were, but they, they knew exactly what, yeah, they were more interested in stinging, you know, you know, it, it was, Did they, they were more interested in catching somebody than actually just marking it and preventing the problem. Did they know who you happened. guys were? Yeah. 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 I don't think necessarily right away, but definitely. Wow. Definitely when the wardens were there, because he was there with those four wardens. Oh, that was the stickered up truck you were saying. And all yeah. Well, my brother in law had it. texted one oh. of the wardens about 50 minutes before I had a warden walk up to me, had texted him, you know, hey, we're heading to that property or whatever. It checked out at the state or whatever. You know, somewhere in there. My brother had in law had a. 42 year relationship with, with this warden had known him for a long time. Wow. Obvi- obviously. Wow. You know, I don't know the dynamics of that anymore. I guess we haven't discussed that. You know, I, I, I don't know if they ever had a conversation after that too much. Dang. Um, so that guy, I, obviously by the, time I had, by the time I had connected all of his text messages and things to that warden and yeah, you know, put things together like, Oh, he called from a restricted number. Why would that be? Oh, you did it. You know, I, I, I mean, I went undercover on that. Man. So I covered a lot to where it was, you know, so obviously TV hunting man was, was leasing the property. Thus he showed yes. up when the wardens yes. were there. Yes. Yes. I, I mean, I kind of felt bad for the guy, you know, at, at initial, you know, initially, I mean, he, you know, How was he with you guys? Video, but, That's what I was gonna say. Like, you know, I started, and, and you know, and and then I started to hear different things he was saying and all this, and you mm, know, and just start running you know, his course, mouth. There was rumors we shot three deer off of there and all kinds of. Yeah, stuff. you're like, you know, I wish we did. It would have been, <laughs> it would have made an awesome film at that point. <laughs> no, that would have been a lot more <laughs> of a dilemma. Yeah. You know? Well, I mean, what would have happened there if I would have shot a deer or we would have shot a deer on that property? Probably what would have happened is I would have paid a lot more money to a much more powerful attorney. And then I would have came back and sued the state. Sure. Is probably what would have happened. Mm. So, you know. Which is kind of what the, CJ's thinking about doing right the now. State. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm. I mean, you got to have some pretty powerful attorney if you're going to go against the state. Yeah, I mean, you're going against, you know, the state, you know, DA or whoever in their home court. <laughs> And it's not going right. to go, it's not going to go over well. No, no. But you know, when you got text messages and, uh, sure. and timelines of things and you bring enough and mm. you get a powerful enough attorney that that'll do it. The, the interesting thought there is like, you know, the fact that you kind of said like you heard him saying things and running his mouth and it's just like, man. And again, maybe at that point, cause how many years ago is this now, Jared? It's, uh, that'll be eight. eight? The 2016. Yeah. Lost that, my finger. About seven years ago. Okay. About so, seven. you know, at that time, like you guys have enough recognition that, you know, if this guy's also making hit a living in the industry, it's like, you know, it seems like a pretty clear misunderstanding. Like, are you happy about it? Probably not. But like, do you really want to come and burn the white tail adrenaline guys for this? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I definitely felt that way. He didn't cover it in any of his show stuff, did he? Or oh, she? hell no. Hell that would, no. That would have been interesting. I, I mean, I would have roasted him. <laughs> I, you know, at the end of it, I wanted to get, you know, I, I reached, I tried reaching out to the warden. You know, I didn't know this at the time until I, I, I dug deeper on things. I mean, the warden didn't want me to reach out to him. Really? You know, but, but by the end of it, it's like, I no, I want the wardens and I want all of them in one room. Yeah. Because I'm going to rip them all to shreds. Huh. 
You don't have to say it on the podcast. Is it somebody we would know? I don't. I don't think probably off the top of your head you okay. know who. More local, is. local regional type. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm going to leave it alone because it's seven years yeah, past. Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, yeah, if it ever comes yeah, what's our up, statute of limitations wow. here? How, how long do we have to go? That's, that's, <laughs> only, that's the only reason Chris Brackett could come on. It's just like, I, I can talk about it now. Statute of limitations passed. <laughs> oh, gotcha. Yeah. But it is funny, you know, you know, love or hate Chris. Like, same, same thing. I mean, Chris was a very popular person that those wardens wanted to make an example of. That was the white whale, right? That they, they were going to... Somebody was going to hang their hat on that one and say, I was one of the guys that took down Chris Brackett. Mm. Same with this situation. I was one of the guys that took out Jared and White Dell Adrenaline in that Minnesota deal. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, you know, that's one thing that I, I'm fortunate on the unscripted side is we're filming so much content. And, and as soon as I walked around the corner and seen a, a fleet of wardens, mm. I turned to Mike, who's the drone deer yep. recovery guy. And he was filming that. I Yoder was? Him. Yes. I no, he that. wasn't. Yeah, Mike Yoder was filming that. What? Um, Wait, filming what? Yeah. Filming him during this Minnesota thing. Seven years yeah. ago? Yeah. Yeah. Really? <laughs> yeah, I turned to Mike and I said, make sure you film everything. Yeah, don't shut I'm, it off. Why is, why, what's that? Don't shut the camera off, Mike. Just keep yeah, it yeah, going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What are the know. chances of that? Mike's, Mike's they, a good they, friend. They, yeah. They tried, yeah, yeah. They tried to get the camera shut down uh as quick as they could listen and, he's uh, amish he doesn't understand a damn thing you're saying <laughs> <laughs> do you guys speak dutch yeah <laughs> we, we're gonna need a, a dutch uh game warden speaking translator uh mike is a super <laughs> dude that's oh, funny yeah. i i did not know that at all yeah 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 we've been buddies for over a decade wow yeah. Yeah. That's cool. where he got his first taste of lawsuits, huh? He's yeah, he's, <laughs> he's got a pile yeah, of them going now. He's huh? racked up at this point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 But it's funny because when you look at stuff like that, like Mike just did a, a thing where he recorded a call with the New York uh, DEC lawyer. Um, basically saying, hey, I got the cease and desist letter. You know, I'm, I'm just so you know, I'm recording you. And they had a conversation there, you know, and it's like. Man, any more, it, it really shows, and to your point, Jared, how critical it was to have probably as much as you did on camera. Yeah, um, I didn't realize until I got in there editing what I had, and that actually helped me align sure. a lot of things, you know, because um, I didn't know, you know, I wasn't hitting the record button, and, yep. you know, you, you you get into these situations, and you remember this guy, you know, whether it's the warden, or this guy said this or that, but when yeah. you got it all recorded, it's like, boom. Well, yeah, you know, and then you got, and then you start bringing in, you know, text messages that were sent to the warden and things like that, and putting timelines together of everything, and it's Jeez. it paints a pretty clear picture. Yeah, that's great. I mean, critical anymore because it, again, you know, and this is kind of what we see with CJ's case is it's CJ's case against whatever the warden and the DA and the state. There, there is no video evidence. There is no recordings. There are no uh, text messages. It's like his word versus theirs and guess what the state's going to prevail every damn time in that situation unfortunately yeah yeah well they'll only provide what what they'll you know and i f found that out in minnesota you know with that deal is is i'm sure either you know <laughs> they only supplied recordings from sure that weren't gonna whatever made know, them look the best to them. exactly you know, it doesn't mean that they didn't record that's yeah you know that's why you know, it's a good idea to be recording on your end. You wow, know, they, for sure. You know, they don't, they don't, they don't like that. And no. they'll try to bully yeah. their way around it. But technically, no, you don't have to stop your recording. Right. You know, so, and, and if they're not doing anything wrong, then. Yeah, they, what are they, they shouldn't, shouldn't care. care. Yeah. They shouldn't care. Mm. So. That's crazy, man. So, you know, if you, you know, one of the big things that I think has, probably continued to help you guys vault where you are is i mean dude you cover a lot of uh trade shows every year or uh consumer shows every year yeah you know we've scaled back over the years we're doing four or five this year yep that great so, american outdoor show is is not easy 11 days of just you know it's it's gotten easier the more i've done it because i know what i'm getting into yeah. and i've kind of figured out the you got the your little place. corner space there in the in the wow. alleyway Honestly, the last two years have been the easiest for me to get through that. Yeah. Foundation. Yeah. You know, um, so, uh, yeah. No, it gets to be a lot, though. 
What yeah. what are the other ones, Jared? Do you know off the top of your head what other shows you guys yeah, are doing? Yeah, so it's uh, the Harrisburg show, and then it it goes Iowa Deer Classic, and then uh, the Open Season Expo in Ohio, Columbus, Ohio, yep. and then Open Season Expo in Wisconsin, Dallas. There you go. So. What do you think of those shows? The, the Iowa and Ohio ones are both ones that we have looked at in the past or we consider going to. Yeah, yeah, they're they're all about neck and neck on those three day shows. You yeah. know, um, cool. as far as. You know, I mean, it. well, it depends on what you're selling, sure. you know, too. You know, I mean, um, one show may... We wouldn't be, you know, really. I mean, if we went, it would just be to walk around and experience it. Like, that. the Deer oh, Classic... Is the Deer you. Classic in March? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and when's the Ohio open season show? All three of March. those shows also that March. I mentioned are in March. Okay. Yeah. 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 That Wisconsin yeah. Dales one is pretty big, and that's that's your that's your home crowd, basically. Right, right, Yeah. 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 Yep. Um, Got to get back to Wisconsin. I know. <laughs> well, those guys look forward to it for sure. Um, you, you know, one of the things that I was, you know, as we kind of looked at that, that evolution of, of your video series and stuff, like obviously you've had a, you know, you've changed a lot of characters over the years in there, you know, you've got some of the same figureheads that, you know, people look forward to, but, um, you know, what is it, do you plan some of that stuff or is it kind of like, Hey, you know, this guy would be a really good one for this hunt or he's already going on this hunt. Let's just tag along. Well, you know, uh, we've run into this where, you know, some of the older crew that I'll, you know, people will be like, Oh, I miss having that. You know, it's, it's, it's like, I miss seeing Al, you know, Jim's been there pretty much the whole time. Right. You know, unfortunately, he's not on the uncuff because he only did one hunt and and, and nothing happened. It was him <laughs> running around the mountain for a week, and Matt Matt filmed it. Matt's like, we didn't film an elk. Was so, he in Idaho? He was, like, he was in Colorado. Oh, he was in one. Colorado. Um, mm-hmm. So unfortunately, people missed him. Uh, you know, I'm sure on on uncuff, but yeah, you know, I mean, people get older. You know, Al Al got married. He's got three kids. He you know hasn't si- scooter. You know, scooter. You know, mm-hmm. he's got two kids now, got married and, you know, you, you, as you get older, you only have so much time, you know, when we were all in our early twenties and mid twenties, it's yeah, like a different ball game. You know, you're, it's a different, different deal. And, and pretty, you know, you, people get busy with their lives and they just, you know, mm-hmm. yeah, Thanks, James. that's just the way it is. So, um, so yeah, it's, it's, I, you know, I mean, we, we've, we've tried to get together, you know, with Al and Scott and Jim, you know, a couple of years ago, we did a Wisconsin for a day or two. That's all they could do, you know, yep. getting the old gang together, but nothing came about of it as far as getting <laughs> on anything worthwhile to produce, yeah. you know, in terms of that. Um, so, and it takes a lot to produce that. So, you know, it's like, am I, would, would it be great to watch Jim running around the mountain trying to find an elk for, tw- you know, for, for seven days and produce something that's 20 minutes, half hour long. That's funny, you know, or whatever. Yeah, it'd be great, but it's going to take, you know, however many 300 hours to produce that and post at least, Yeah, you know, it's, it's like, uh, yeah, that's tough. You know, what, uh, what is the, does that sound loud? What is the thought process, Jared, of, uh, like, as you guys are going into a season, like, is there any kind of storyboarding that happens or is it just literally, Hey, each of us have our own hunts. We're going to do some of these together. And you know, we know what we're doing yep. as far as filming. Let's that's, just, let's just that's go. That's exactly. It'd be just like if guys go hunting and there's a camera there, you know, I mean, that's, that's basically, you know, uh, Tanner, he's, he's a newer character. He's on uncuffed a lot. He did a lot of hunting. Mm-hmm. Um, it takes the mm-hmm. right kind of individual to really, you know, you know, Chansey is one of those characters that is really good hunter. He's a really good character to drive the story unscripted. Just he's mm-hmm. going to say all the things without even thinking about it. He's just going to, you you know, lay it all out for people. You yep. know, uh, you know, I'm a little bit more closed personality to, to, to where maybe I don't, you know, I don't, I don't fit it quite as well as those, those guys like a Jim or a Chansey or a Tanner or a Shay or, a, um, you know, I, I don't check those boxes quite as well. I don't think as, as they do, but the, you know, it's, it's like, that's who they are. Well, don't you know? cut yourself short though. That people want to see Jared out there with the stick bow running and gun. Somebody's got to be the brains of the operation too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, in the beginning, I always said I'd jump behind the camera a lot and film Jim <laughs> yeah. more than myself, Yeah. you know, because I was like, you're the entertainer. I just bring sanity to the operation. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> that, that was my i always looked at it like well he's a better entertainer he's a better character for the videos my place is better served behind the camera and, and you see that a lot in those earlier videos yeah you know yeah so as you guys kind of you know look back on some of the places that you have hunted in even to what you're getting into now like i know you know jared and i We've, we used to hunt Kansas basically, well, I did, every year. And then, you know, there was a couple bumps in there where it's like, holy shit, we didn't get drawn this year. This is a first. Are you starting yeah. to see that in some of the places? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, it's uh, we're seeing more of more of the crew that doesn't get drawn for Kansas. I had uh, somebody recently told me they had three or four points for a zone in Iowa that should have taken two to draw. Wow. So you're seeing that. You know, you're you're just seeing. I th I think people are just really enjoying venturing mm -hmm. to, to new ground and doing the, you know, experiencing hunting in another area. And you're you're just seeing a big uptick of that. You yeah. know, and yeah, I mean, so, all the resources are there to. Like I said before, I didn't know. I didn't doable. even know how to go to Ohio and hunt from Pennsylvania, let alone drive across to Kansas and do it. Now mm -hmm. the resources are all there for me to. Say, right. oh well th th it. think about what that would have looked like you know 15 20 years ago it's like i okay i gotta go on the internet i gotta get to a desktop and pull up map quest and f figure out my route you know and then yeah. ev everything in between you have to do all the research ahead of time like you said you went to south dakota right. three times before you even yeah could pull that yeah and i off. never even when i ended up going to south dakota i never even went back to anything that i had yes. drove you know by or whatever you know in those early days you know uh you know, so I, I learned a lot through that. You know, I was kind of in that mentality back then where it's like, I need to know every detail and every, right. everything, everything where I'm going to be hunting, how the deer are using the property and all this and what property I'm going to be hunting. And, 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 uh, I abandoned all of that. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we've so, seen that uh, in Kansas, at least on our side, like I would say early in our Kansas years, you know, 10 years ago and to five years ago, it was like, we were pretty specific on how we were hunting, where we were hunting. We knew kind of, we even followed some of these deer for multiple years in the area. The last two or three, it's been like, man, we really have had to just kind of wing it because there's so many people uh, and a lot of Kansas residents getting displaced to the public land because other places right. are getting leased that it's like, man, all of the things that we knew so well uh, wouldn't work anymore, <laughs> you know? Right. So we got to, there's only so much you can do as a non-resident right. too. It's, it's not and, like we can drive out to these Kansas farms, even the ones, you know, so we've had some leases in Kansas. We can't go and like, you know, from summer to fall, you know, uh, you know, be moving cameras from mineral sites to, you know, to active scrapes and be there, you know, doing, uh, cruising the property, looking for fresh sign and stuff. like that. Just, it couldn't happen It's 16 hours away for us. So it's like, Hey, right. let's, get the most bang for our buck let's go in, let's go you know that third week of third week of uh november you know and try to line that with a good right good weather week and like you're gonna kill one it's kansas you know that was that was yeah, the mindset yeah. you know and, and and i think to matt Rinella's point it, you know you know we were talking about that a little bit earlier and you were just talking about the pressure of the public lands you know i see that as that was coming anyway yeah that was that that was coming without because you know I, I i mean you could see that coming 15 years ago if you're visionary and and you, you you look at it people were losing their ground and the whole mentality on public land back then 15 years ago you know you'd go to a show or you'd get to talk to somebody if you're a public land hunter it, it was like almost depressive to you know yeah a depressive conversation oh like that's public oh, yeah that's that tough man shifted uh, <laughs> yeah. quite a bit yeah. and you know i i think you know, absolute moving forward more, there needs to be more public land opportunities. And I think Rennell is involved in some of that expansion of, mm -hmm. you know, uh, from my understanding, block managements and things like that in Montana. And I mean, that's the pathway forward that was coming with or without hunting content. Sure, media, yeah. in my opinion. Sure. I, I mean, I believe that's the truth. Maybe it's, you know, progressed it a little bit quicker, but at the same rate, it's shown people that were hunting public land. Hey, there's a positive side to it. You sure. can be successful yeah. out there doing it. So, I mean, 
you know, you can take that however you want, you, you, you know, but I, I do think it was coming either way. Mm -hmm. Agree. You know? Yeah. I think as you kind of saw, I mean, they were either going to quit hunting or they were going to shift to public. Like that, those were your two options as they started to right. lose this access. Those are stuff. the options that that's yeah. what's happening is like, you know, I don't know what the breakdown is, but let's say two thirds of guys will, if they get displaced, okay, they'll go to public, you know, they'll end up in this lowest pool of access and the other third will quit. And so like right. we talk about these declining hunter, hunter numbers all the time. It's like, I'm, I'm adamantly believing that it's because they don't have a place to hunt. That's why people, sure. that's and, why people quit. They hunting. also, they also maybe don't have the confidence or, or think that public's worthless or whatever. So, yeah. I mean, you can here again, it's an immeasurable, but yeah, you know, there has been a dramatic shift that I have seen in the way people talk about public land. Yeah. It's much more positive than it was 15 years ago. Yeah. And I mean, listen, it, negative, the, it's the hard. The negativity of it is how many people are hunting. Yeah. It. That, I mean, there's no doubt. Like right. if you, if you've hunted private your entire life and you've got to go to public, it is going to be substantially harder for you to be successful. You will see other guys. You will have hunts blown. You will have to work harder. You will have to scout more ground. That's just, that's part of it. And to your point, there probably are a third of guys who are just like, maybe I don't love hunting that Well, it's much. interesting you say that, though. I mean, that is the mentality shift, isn't it? Like, whatever it is, 10, 15 years ago, and I told in the beginning of this podcast, I said my mentality of public land was like, oh, it's not as good because it gets, it gets pressured. Sure. Yeah. That yeah, probably did. wasn't nearly as true then as it is now. Like back then, that yeah. was that was just a perception, and and yeah, there was some pressure, but you know, guys could still go to Iowa public land and, and do really well. well dude, with there it. were now and yeah. Kansas public now. The perception is still, you know, maybe it's even flipped. It's like, right. hey, hunting public is cool. Like it's cool. Right, but, right. Well, you know, and, and the hunting public putting out all the videos on 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 YouTube. Mm -hmm. I mean, they have a very positive, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm it's a very positive message to people yeah. about like you can have a great hunt and yeah, sure. Sometimes you run into other hunters and that's just part of the deal. You know, it's very positive though. Sure. Yeah. You know, I think know. that the other big thing is, is um, there weren't nearly as many people in the archery seasons back then as there are today. And yep. yeah, some of that's crossbows. Some of that's just new technology with other things. But I mean, back then I remember archery hunting Pennsylvania public land and like, my dad and I didn't see anybody, mm. you know, I mean, it was desolate. I see grouse hunters or, you know, something like that. We didn't see anybody else. And now it's like, there's a lot of people in there, mm -hmm. you know, there's just, there's just more guys hunting more time in the archery season. Um, right. so that, that all that stuff has a dramatic effect. The, the bottom line is, is because we have lost some hunter numbers, you can still be very successful in public. Like, yeah, there sure. maybe are more people there, but I mean, there's still plenty of great habitat and some really good deer hunting in those places. You just, again, you kind of got to work for it and you need a little bit of luck on your side. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. And you know, I mean, that's part of the thing that we looked at, you know, that was one of the, you know, the, the uncuffed, you know, Chancey brought that up in 2017. That's on the video. The first time I ever heard uncuffed and the door knocking and I rolled it around for a while, you know, what, whatever it was, four years. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, one of the one of the reasons that I move forward with it is is because the influx in sure. public land. You know, it was like, well, it'll show people there's other opportunities out there, which will help to dissipate it. Potent, you know, a, a bit. Mm -hmm. You know, obviously, in a perfect world, we just have more public land acreage, but right. that takes time to to you know, ten, twenty, thirty years to to acquire enough public to keep up with the demand or the uh, influx there so who yeah. was your who was your best do, uh, door knocker on uncuffed i'd i'd say uh, that'd be between tanner and chancy yeah you know they're, they're both good at it yeah be better than i am um uh tanner's tanner's done a i i think there's more of that with with him mm -hmm. in in this uncuffed um but yeah th those would be the two that would be the best at it I yeah. could see Chansey working I, I, over I, an old lady on her farm. Yeah, yeah, sweet talker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah well, it's kind of funny. He ended up sweet talking the old lady where he could have killed that two twenty buck the year before on resurgence. You know, and and that you know it was like, I mean, he was the buck was out there where he could have made a move on him, and he was pretty damn sure he could have gotten permission on that 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 season and the next year he he eventually went and knocked on her door and did get permission from her um, but you know the buck was nowhere 
nowhere yeah. to be found. But oh, that's um, wild, man. Yeah, it's it's uh, yeah. I think for a lot of people, it's an intimidating <laughs> thing. Or you know, they hear enough horror stories about it that are like, it's not even worth my time. Like it's gonna there's the, every farm's leased, every farm's owned by hunters. Like no nobody is getting access for free anymore. Yeah, yeah, but the, you know, I mean, I think that's more regional. And then you, you, you know, the Seek One guys, they do a lot of that. Absolutely, they, like all of they, their they stuff. Kill a lot of that and they, they mm-hmm. kill. I, I mean, they kill some mega giants doing that. Sure, you know, yeah. um, they're starting to branch out uh, too, though. I mean, even those guys will tell you. We had Leon just a couple of weeks ago, and he's like, "Yeah, he's like a lot of the doors that I go to now. It's like, yeah, you're the third guy today that's asked. Mm-hmm. That that's yeah, my yeah. fear. It's like well, I don't, I don't want to." I don't want to burden people by it's like, man, if you have a good piece or it just happens to be, you know, whatever, it's like, I don't want to be the the 10th guy, like in the past two weeks that's come and asked. I mean, I, I will, right. I guess if, if that's what it comes <laughs> right. down to, but I feel bad. I feel bad. I don't want yeah. to bother people. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm not, afra- I, I'm not afraid to ask either though. I mean, I, there's a part of me that enjoys the door knocking aspect. Well, I, I was going to say there's some, I, yeah, good, Jared. Go no, you're good. Oh, I was going to say Tanner's had real good luck just making phone calls oh yep. wow just call yep. yeah. like he's 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 done real well at that rather than the door knock um i mean he's done the door knocking too i mean there's some of that in in the uncuffed all of that was captured so it's yeah. it's like that's one of the stipulations if you're going uncuffed you have to get it recorded i, I will tell you dude we when we went out to north dakota for muley's for this it was the second time mm-hmm. so we'd been out there once and kind of got the lay of the land hunted all public had good success like day two and three and then came home and then we're like, we have to do this hunt again. So two years later when we drew again or the next year or something, I spent the whole summer leading up to that hunt making calls. I gritted everybody out. I found all these different, and I called everybody, called all these landowners. And we got some tentative, like, yeah, you know, let me know when you get out here and, and we'll, mm-hmm. we'll talk about it. Like everybody's got a nephew that's running, running an outfit type of a deal. Like, I mean, literally everybody got us a sweet little place to stay. Yep. The guy's like, yeah, you can park your camper there. You know, there's electricity. You can hook up to it and stuff. And, and so that was great. But like... That panned out in a big way because, like, even though you know, I hadn't shook in their hand and stuff, it's like I I knew everybody. Like, I'd talk the guy that owns this big house on the hill over here has a. I talked to him. I, I called him. Like, if I had to, we could call him. And one day we got a Jeremy got a flat tire. Like, mm-hmm. way we were having a rough trip. It was like day mm-hmm. five of seven or something. But we were it's classic in, white tail adrenaline type stuff, you know? Yeah, we we weren't seeing flat anything. flat tires are Jared's <laughs> nemesis at this point. <laughs> Yeah. We weren't seeing anything. And like, so when that happened, you know, Jeremy's got this big, uh, you know, big freaking raptor tooth looking rock jammed up in his Ugh. thing. And he's just like getting ready to I was cussing wrap, a storm, wrap it up right there. I, I knew exactly who to call. I was like, yeah. I'm going to call that farmer that lives up there, see if he's got a, and sure enough, he had like a 24 uh, seven tractor. It was a Sunday or something. It was a tractor service shop. He's like, yeah, bring it down. If we can patch it, we'll patch yeah. it. So it was good. You know, we were able to kind of make connections and it's, it's good to just for people to be like, oh yeah, I remember, I remember you called me. Well, it's those small towns, man. And I love it. Like it, to be honest, like that's that, you know, we're going to buy in a steer from somebody before we left. I know. Well, that's the, that's yeah. She's like, Hey, somebody kind of stuck me with all this beef. And like, you know, I, I, she said she was going to get it and she wouldn't. And I was like, how much do you want? And I forget what she told us. I was like, yeah, load it up. I'll take it all. You know, she's like, really? <laughs> you know, but yeah. when we go back out there, we may make a call and she's like, hey, yeah, I've got a bunch of land. You want to come hunt? Yeah. Right. I don't know. Right. I mean, that's the kind of stuff. And I, I enjoy, I think, especially some of the older people that you meet in door knocking. If you get like the inside, you know, come have a cup of coffee, then some of those people just, they're lonely, you know, and if you can just strike up a good conversation, number one, I think you're better for it. Like you, you've now met somebody who's got some really cool history to talk to you about, but they, they just appreciate it. Cause frankly, a lot of those people in those kind of back towns and, and out in the farm, like they don't see Lovely. and talk to many, yeah. many people that right. way. Right. But, yeah. When they're off the grid like that. Yeah. It's, it's different. North Dakota. Yeah. I mean, that's one state there where it's, it's pretty easy, I think, to get permission there. Mm-hmm. And the reason I say that is because I remember back in the day, that would have been 03, 04, right around there. I'd go out there and, and uh, you know, knock on a few doors and they'd, yeah, my land's not posted. It, it was almost like you were annoying them. Yeah, they're like, it's so, already not posted. Just well, that's, that's why. <laughs> yeah, that's that how was, it is out there. Like, it was assumed that if, it it's, if it's not right. posted, you can hunt it. It, yeah, exactly. They're one of the states that has that, um, mm-hmm. at, at least unless I've changed it. I mean, no, it's still that way. That. As long as it's not electronically posted on like yeah. Onyx and yep. stuff. 
And their plots yep. program it, is yes. amazing. I, yeah. Yep. The, the plots program that's been around for a long, long time. Yeah. Um, all right. That number three. Number two. <laughs> <laughs> uh, number two. We're down to the, the, the third segment here. Third disc. <laughs> yeah. All right. Intermission number two. <laughs> Feature three. <laughs> Feature three. Here we go. How many discs are we going to make here? <laughs> well, well, I'd have to charge them lights. That's <laughs> uh, all right. Yeah, it's funny, man. But I do think that there's plenty of opportunity, especially, and it is tougher. Like, you get into Pennsylvania or Ohio or Illinois, like, it is It is a lot tougher. There's sure. just a lot more people trying to get access more to those people. places. Yeah. But Kansas right. and, and North Dakota, South Dakota, like, there's, there's some good opportunities still in a lot of those places. Yeah. Right. So. Yeah. I still like the clean simplicity of public land, you know, and, and we haven't done a lot of the, you know, it took us three seasons to get an uncuffed bow kill. Um, wow. So, I mean, I mean, it's, it turned out to, but I like that, you know, I didn't want it to be like this complete, you know, all of a sudden flip, you know, and, and I, I just like the freedom with, with it still, you know, you you, you, you don't feel like you owe anybody anything. You, you just went out there and it's, 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 you know, on the public land side of things, you mm-hmm. know, whereas it's like, you kind of feel like, you know, it's not, you know, with how much people are paying for, uh, there's some great clips in there too. Tanner pulled up to one guy and asked him about hunting and he talks about how he gets 25, 30 grand to lease his property. Wow. And the guy ended up being super cool though. Super great. Um, he's like, you know, I wish there was more public cause there's not enough of it. And it's a, mm-hmm. it's a great piece it's in feature seven. Um, but, uh, it just shows that other side of, yeah, you know, of, of, uh, but it's, it's, it's unique. You know, some guys, you know, some of those private landowners, they absolutely do not want to lease their land and, oh, but they'll be more than happy to let you hunt it. Yeah. You know, we've been to a few of them. Yeah. You know. Yeah, I mean, we've had a lot of people that we've talked to that frankly have had bad experiences with leasers and you know, it it they almost would rather especially if you know someone they know and you kind of make that connection, you know, you have a better chance of getting in there than, you know, just waving a bunch of money in front of them. Right. Right. They don't like being bought. There's certain people that just don't, you know. No. Huh. What? There's different ways to go about it too. I mean, I think so. Base camp leasing was the, at least to us, that was a really notable. One of the first ones. Notable, mm-hmm. and there's there's some other ones, sure. right? I think that uh, services basically they connect, you know, yeah. land and it and it's easy and it's it's. Uh, yeah, one of my buddies, long time buddies, he he did that. Yep. He was uh, Joe Brooks. I met him years. Oh yeah. Ago. He did base camp. He still does it. I think yeah. he does too. We know uh, Joe, right? Indiana I, maybe uh, yeah. or Ohio. Can't remember. Ohio. Yeah. I think he moved Ohio? from Michigan to Ohio. Yeah. Yeah. When I met him, he worked at Cabela's. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And, and so, like the services like that are are nice because they're convenient and they're they, there's no there's no haggle. It, it's here. It is. You lease it. You have it. But right. the flip side of it is like you don't know. You don't know who's hunting your property. <laughs> like it's just kind of it's it's a bit it's very much a, a, a financial sure. it's a transaction as opposed yeah. to a relationship with a hunter and a landowner and that right. that i think has had some negative consequence across the board um i lucked out on our kentucky one in that it was in the same place i owned property and the warden owned the property we were leasing he didn't have time to hunt because he's out you know patrolling so much and he has other places to hunt and so that we don't even lease that anymore, but I have a really great relationship with him now and can call him and text him anytime. And he's, he's one of the good ones, Mm -hmm. you know, and it's, it all just by happen chance was because I leased his property. Heck I leased his property for a year or two (coughs) and I didn't even hunt it, but it was because I knew maybe it'd help him out and I could help me out on my properties, you know, having the warden be able to say, Hey man, somebody's at my place and I'm not there. Well, there's nothing wrong inherently with leasing. I mean, that's that's a great way for the landowner no. to profit off their ownership and to let people hunt and stuff. But there's, you know, people ask us all the time, like, because everybody's looking for a lease. Like, you know, when people tell us that, I'm like, who isn't, you know? Yeah. But they're like, what do you think of like these base camp leasing services and whatever? And I'm like, you know, good company, probably good people involved there and stuff. But I was just like, I, I, I've we've wasted a lot of time and, and money um, on, on those types of deals. I, I recommend that people just 
just make connections. Like, you know, you use your people skills, you know what I mean? Just re- reach out to people you might know or, or just, just work different leads. I think ultimately you're going to be way better off doing it that way or even door knock and then t- trying to use a service in my opinion. Sure. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, so Jared, obviously had you had your hands full this fall with Uncuffed <laughs> and the launch and everything, but I would assume like content was collected this fall, right, for the next one. It it, it was. It just it, you know we got uh, we got a little bit of a late start on some things, and um, I think I'll probably end up merging the the good portions of this past November um, mm-hmm. with part of la- the season before and or part of the next season Got is it. what I think we'll do with it. You know, it's the first time we haven't had enough content to really make what I feel is a, is a great season. Mm-hmm. It, it was close in many ways. I mean, there was some really close mega giant, you know, yeah. situations that <laughs> were as close as you can get to uh, and some some really great stuff there but overall just not quite enough on the the kill side to to really but uh the season before yeah i mean that's already going to be an epic epic mainly bow you know that's kind of one of the things that i looked at um the october before last is i was like i these productions are just getting too big too too, they take too much to produce. I don't want to go backwards in quality. Sure. Um, so let's let's downscale how much we're filming in the fall in terms of the 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 hunts. Because um, you still got to you know in our format you still got to film a lot of content if you're gonna carve a story out of of what you got there. So it's like, yeah, well, I'm more I'm more of a bow hunter. We're gonna focus more on bow. We're gonna mm-hmm. do a little bit of gun. You know, I I'd, I'd like to get get cousin jim in there a little bit more on the gun side of things and then probably just mainly bow um is where i'm gonna head with it you know the next season that that's gonna be a killer set the next season on top of this one yeah um the hunts just came together so much quicker and uh you know i'm glad to hear people are really really enjoying uncuffed but the next season things come together so fast and there's some incredible hunts coming on that one too. So I'm pretty excited about that. Yeah. Can we, uh, not to put you back in that place, but can we relive the, the production dude? I mean, there was a, a while there. What was the original proposed release date of this, of uncut Christmas of 2022 was the original. Yeah. Oh, no way. Christmas yeah, of 2022. Yeah. And yeah, when did it I finally could- come out? I mean, I didn't say 2022, but that's, that's what, you know, I said by Christmas, um, and, but I didn't put 2022, but that was, that was what I was shooting for. That's what I thought I was going to hit. Talk about Um, a year and a month ago. Yeah. Yeah. So it ended up, it ended up being by Christmas Christmas of of 23. So you weren't, you weren't far off when you said Christmas. It just, yeah, yeah. Well, I didn't put it, I didn't at the time, I didn't think it was necessary, but I, that's what I was shooting for, you know? Um, And that's what I thought, you know, uh, I thought that's, that's what I'd hit. Because I mean, dude, we were, we were concerned for you when you started to break it out day by day and we're watching Jared, like, burning it at both ends pretty freaking hard yeah yeah no i and uh, you know that was that was something i had to push push it to the max (laughs) almost to the max because i knew if i went back to to the extremity of what i once did i'd completely be burnt out probably forever on producing again sure and i you know, I, I kind of found my sweet spot, which was about 80 to 100 hours a week. Holy that's, that's cow, dude. Spot. And I can maintain that for months. But, yeah, you know, I knew that if I started pushing up into that 110, 120 and not taking a little bit of time for myself, shoot longbow, that was probably the best method of break, yep. yeah. release, compression. Um, but I knew if I pushed into that 110, 120, because I, I did try pushing it up and then I could I could see how it was affected. It wasn't so sustainable. I to, yeah, I had to, okay, I, I'm going to just maintain and stay right in this sweet spot. And, you know, it, it was a dilemma. You know, uh, 
but by the time I got to the shows last year, I had so many people that walked up and said, Hey, I pre-ordered. I don't care when it comes out. Just mm-hmm. make sure it's the quality that it, you mm-hmm. know, and it, it's like, well, that's what I want to do, which is a lot more work for me. Right. But that's what I want to do is deliver sure. the quality of the product that, you know, and it did end up being three hours, you know, longer than I originally anticipated, you know, expected it to be too. But um, to produce it to this level just takes a ton of extra effort, especially on the audio side, you know, and sure. people that watch it and, and the, you know, a lot of people don't understand what goes into that. But if you don't do all the things that I do in post, then it ain't what it is, you know? Yeah. So that's sure. a simple, easy way to explain it. I know? mean, 15 hours of content is, is insane. So was there a, a period of, or uh, a point of uh, panic in 2022 where you're like, we might not hit this. Yeah. 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 It started to hit me late September, October. So late September of 2022, you started thinking like, Hey, we might not hit this Christmas. Well, I realized, uh, you know, that it was quickly developing into seven disc and, you know, and, and I, uh, I just realized that, and and October is when I started to look futuristically and I ended up pulling the reins back on filming some different hunts that fall. Cause I was like, we don't yeah. have the horsepower, the manpower to produce this yeah. amount of content to this level. We, we, we just don't, don't have that. And, and that's when I started to kind of pull the reins back on some, yep. some things there for the future. You know, that doesn't help me in that moment, but, um, you know, with the current project, but at least not get me into a predicament yeah. again. So, sure. so around that time, like September, October, whatever of 2022, did you, did you come out and say like, Hey, we're, it, it, we're going to push it. We're going to push it. Oh, push the date. Yeah. No, I didn't. No, I didn't. I, you know, and I, I, I maybe should have by late October. Um, probably should have, should have tried to well, push whatever. it. I assume you did I at didn't. some point. Right. So like, yeah christmas came and went i assume at some point you said hey listen it just hasn't happened yet yeah well it was a tough pill for me to swallow i bet you know you know it was a tough not to make it about me but i mean it's it's it was it was frustrating to 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 to, you know be entering early december and and realize how far out you are and then i'm like i'm like okay if i really just push myself to no end Maybe in the next forty-five days, I can. Com- I would not even. Cl- I mean, no, yeah, the it entire even. thing was just. Yeah, it was very frustrating. And it's like everything just took so much longer than what than what I, I, you know, and I, I, I can't. I, I don't even know how many dates I put out there. Like, okay, I think by this date, I think by that date, yeah. I, like I know what quality I can produce. It's a lot easier for me to. S- to, to guarantee quality, know my capabilities, but to get it there, to get it yeah. all flowing and, and sound in the way it sounds and make it all come to light and all the storyline and everything to just flow. That's very difficult to, to, to project, um, on something like this, that's true unscripted where you're carving a mountain of content out and then you got to yeah. make it all sound good and flow and everything, you know, like I was saying, it's, you know, not production's difficult in any any type of genre long format production is even scripted stuff but you you know it's hard to find because you got to be an artist and you got to be a story writer like there is no written story but you got to be able to carve out it'd be like tell me your life story okay Give give me a year to write it down you hand me a thousand pages of and it's like that's what i got to work with but i got to get it down to 10. Yep. And I can't add to it and I can't take, you, you know, I can take away, but I can't add to it because now it's yeah. scripted. Yeah. It's posted, you know, it's not part of your authentic. And it's hard to explain that, but no, that's, we're getting it. That's one of the things that makes it different and makes it what it is. And sure. Is, and that's why it's so difficult to, to, to replicate it. I mean, you think about thousands of hunting productions out there and, there's some similarities, but I've had many people over the years that tell me that, that it does have its own standalone kind of, yeah, 
you know, and it's like most products you can take like, Hey, I want to build this, whatever arrow rest. Well, you take a look at it, you piece it apart, you could duplicate it pretty mm-hmm. easy. Right. Yeah. Productions not really that way you can hand the same content to a thousand editors it's going to come out a thousand different ways well i mean i think you guys have taken the cinematography side also from you know 2007 8 9 time frame to where you are now like that you know that natural evolution has happened but i'm sure from from your all side you understand like kind of what really can help tie and build that story and pull people into it yeah it's very hard to do to get that cinematic what you're talking about there and keep it raw and unscripted. Absolutely. That's very difficult to, 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 you know, we, we rolled that around back around that 2014, 2015 era, me and John Adams and John Adams did, did uh, quite a bit of filming uh, that season. And he brought some of that cinematic. We, we kind of like spitballed ideas and, and, and how can we keep it what it is, but elevate that, that more cinematic side, but keep the raw unscripted. And that's challenging. That's difficult to do. Yeah. yeah. No, I think for sure. Well, even like uh, we were watching this morning, uh, you guys put out like, I think, what was it? The feature four piece on YouTube or and yep. maybe a little bit of five, you know, even just cause we've been there, like you guys stalking through the, the drainages and hearing that, that wind. And I'm like, yeah, I, I, like I, I know that wind very, very well, <laughs> you know? And it's, but yeah. that's the kind of side of it. That, you know, I think, again, from a product, because there's plenty of content out there, and it's not, I, don't, I won't say it's bad content by any means, but no. the the cinematography side of it, the storyline side of it is very loose. Which is not the emphasis. Yeah, yeah it's, just, it's the emphasis is, I'm in a tree stand, here comes the buck, I kill the buck. That's it. Sure. That's, that's, the, so, you know, I think that the more that, you know, content is evolving away from that 22 minute television type episode, the more we want to see, you know, a a, a story take place, a a journey take place, a struggle take place, because frankly, that's more realistic at the end of the day anyways. Mm -hmm. For most people. Yeah. Yeah, For most people. Absolutely. And, and it's, you know, if it's a well told story with a lot of dynamic to it, then even if it doesn't end in an, in the hunter getting an animal, that's, that's okay. And I, I, I like that, you know, I, it shows the reality of, of, of hunting for, for mm-hmm. most people. Yeah. You know? Yep. So I guess the you real, the real question know, is Jared, did you get out this fall? I got out a little bit yeah. um, more, more to film around the 17th. Um, I had to re-export everything again in early November. I did get out to to drive while while things were exporting i got to drive out and look look for deer but i had not even bought my iowa hunting license (laughs) i bought my tag just not the hunting license i i i forgot and i just i was like so busy (laughs) and i was like i made damn sure i didn't have a bow or anything with me with my tag without my hunting license but i think it was like the 12th or 13th i was like well i better get that before i forget and yeah and it was i think the 17th when i stepped into to starting to film and then I did end up getting out a bit. I didn't get one. I I did have a, a few good days there where I got on some 150 class animals, 155. I got on a 175, but he didn't quite he didn't cross the private line like mm-hmm. I needed him to. Uh, uh, and uh, was that in Iowa? All in that Iowa? was in Iowa. Yeah, yep. yeah, that was in Iowa. No Kansas yeah, this year to, for you. I had to eat. I had to eat a few tags that I had drawn. Oh, really? Um, so yeah, yeah, never made it, and so that—that's yeah, the ultimate them, self-discipline, there, man. The ultimate when sacrifice. Si- well, you're sitting on well, dude, tags. I, I quit. I quit on my elk <laughs> journey for a while. I'll get back on that, but I mean, I ate. I drew Utah. I had waited for years for points Whoa. through that. Never made it because I was buried in editing. I Whoa. drew Colorado. I had waited a few years. I I ate that one. I had a New Mexico tag that I burnt because oh. of staying editing. Um, I've done that with Montana on a couple of occasions, not drew, but general tags, you know, and I finally was just like, wow, I'm blowing a lot of money and, and points here and, yeah. you know, for, and I never get, to, get to go. Yeah. So, well, I think to your, your point of like framing this next one up to be very consumable for you as the producer and that same level of what, you know, us as the audience have come, like, that's the key piece there. 
The Hunter Podcast is brought to you by Muddy. Man, Jared, we probably have been using Muddy products for at least 10 years now. It's a long time, dude. It's been a long time. And I can remember when it was simply just safety harnesses and camera arms of all things. And, you know, that's evolved to where you and I both have a bunch of Muddy box blinds as well. I would say a bunch. But yeah, they, they've come a long way. And certainly the box blinds are, are huge. Shot that buck over your shoulder out of a Muddy box blind a couple of years ago. The harness and, and all of the other safety accessories really are, are a major component of, of what Muddy offers for me. Um, you know, we've had some injuries in the past, you know, some, some tree stand accidents. This, this is all back before we were using, uh, you know, frankly, harnesses, mm -hmm. uh, the lineman's belt while we're hanging stuff, and the safe lines. I have those in every single one of, uh, you know, our fixed tree stands now. And uh, so we really have made safety a priority. Uh, that, that's a big deal for us. And, uh, you know, Muddy has everything we need for that. Yeah, and I think uh, the cool thing about Muddy is anyone listening to the Hunter podcast can save 20% using the code HUNTER20. That's H-U-N-T-R-2-0. Uh, anything that you can see on the Muddy Outdoors store online, use that code, save yourself 20% for this hunting season. Go Muddy. You know, when you start to think about the, well, really, man, it, I mean, the money is one thing. It's the time to accrue those points. Um, you know, that, that's, that's stuff that you're not getting back. Well, then I found out that on, on Utah and Colorado, if I would have known within 30 days before the season, oh. I could have handed in my tag, kept my points. Wow. Ate the money, wow. But at least kept my points. And I didn't know about that until after wow. with both Utah. And then I find out with Utah, I can't even begin to start building points for five more years. That was four, three, four years ago. Really? Because wow. you drew. Yeah. There's like a gap I drew, there. Now I can't even begin to build points for five years. So that screwed me for 15 years. Whoa. Dude, let's not that, let that happen again. If you need somebody with the same first name to fill your spot <laughs> yeah. in, in the future. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, we were talking about it. Can we, did we decide, can we buy a Kansas preference point without applying? Yeah, you can. Okay. Yeah, because that was one where we were like, well, you know, if we've got Iowa this year, do we want to draw there? Like, there's only enough... I mean, that's the problem is like, even when people talk and I'm sure it's the same way with you, Jared is like, you know, people hear this and like, man, it'd be nice to hunt like all the time. It's like, yeah, dude, I don't know what that's like. Cause I don't do that. <laughs> yeah. I, I actually haven't done that much bow hunting for seven, eight years. Yeah. If I add up the, the days, you know, I think I got four days in and 21 and, and I guess last year I ended up getting. I, not this last year, 23, but 22, I think I ended up getting about 12 or 14 days in something like that. Wow. I, I ended up getting on a, a big buck for a while and didn't get him, but, um, I got one, but, uh, and then this year I only got a few days in and, and, uh, a couple of them years back in the day, 2017, 18, I didn't get started bow hunting deer till the day before thanksgiving and the day after thanksgiving i didn't even get to bow hunt no way so, how's that yeah how's that kind of sitting with you well that was part of the reevaluation as well it's like we don't have enough manpower to produce these but then who i am is i want to produce it to the highest quality that my abilities are capable of mm -hmm. you know that's part of the creative side of me is i you know and that's why I don't fit the YouTube format, right? Is because I got to turn content quick and I can't produce it to, to what my vision is for it mm -hmm. and do that. I, I can't do both, Yeah, you know? And, but you know, if I was doing, you know, something close quarters, like uh, something archery related in a shop and giving people a little tip or technique, that's, that's quick, easy production to produce. Your audio is all controlled environment. You know, you can spit out a really high end production really quick, like that type mm -hmm. of. You know, but our format for the hunting, I, you know, I can't produce that to that high quality standard. Keep it all raw and scripted and carve all that out. I, I, I just can't do that and turn it quick enough for YouTube. So it's not really an option. Yeah. Um, because I won't find any value in that if I'm not pushing my abilities. Yeah. To what I vision it, you know, it'll just, yeah, you might grow a big following, but that doesn't mean that much to me is in terms of right. what I put out, you know? So yeah. Hmm. it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's a tough a, spot. It's a bit man. Of a dilemma. Well, yeah. I mean, cause obviously, you know, well, it's a business decision. I mean, have you ever crunched the numbers to be like, you know, <laughs> I don't know if you well, want to crunch the numbers to see what you're yeah. making per hour. <laughs> 
Oh, no. No, you don't want to look at that for sure. <laughs> well, no, no, no. Don't, yeah, don't do that. I'm talking about, you know, <laughs> so you're selling DVDs right now. That's your primary, right. a, if right. not the primary source of income. If you were to right. put all of this 15 hours, let's say you put up 15 one hour long videos on YouTube, yeah, what that would generate just, just from I YouTube. I don't, I don't think, I don't think enough. Okay. Yeah. Not, not to produce it to that, <laughs> that, that quality and, and, and be able to afford to bring in the people that film it and to keep everything operating. I would tend I to agree. That. I would say, yeah, you're probably I mean, right. I was going to say, cause you know what we make on, uh -huh. on YouTube. It's like, you know, I mean, maybe over time. I mean, like, what do you think they could get? I bet, I bet each one of these would get, I don't know, a lot. I bet each one, I don't know, half, half million to a million. I bet well, each one would get. So, I mean, I, views? I know talk and it's been a year or two, right? But I know I had a long conversation with somebody who makes decent money on YouTube. I would say decent money on YouTube. I think they got like 20 million views on stuff that was probably 15 to 20 minutes long for the most part. And they made about 90,000 from YouTube. Here's what you should do. Absolutely. If you're not already... And I understand why you can't. It's like you, you can't ask people to pay for DVDs and then put uh, put it out there for free. Get like get that. Your, get your DVDs. Yeah. Get that, your DVDs. And then put it out there for free. That wouldn't make any sense. But like, dude, <laughs> dude at, the, at this point, and I'm saying this as a customer who's bought all of the DVDs prior to this, those should all be on YouTube. Uh, well, I guess all, all I guess you are ones? still selling them. I guess, yeah, people still buy the old yeah. ones is the only reason. Or digital download at that point. Sure. Like sure. If, if you're going to... like. You know, because I know you guys sell like packages too of like, hey, you know, get yeah. these videos and these videos. You know, the new one, maybe it's like, you know, I like having these on the shelves and stuff. But like, yeah, the older ones from a digital download side. So you keep your overhead down and yeah. you're not making unless you have. We're we're, we're working towards that, uh, you know, resurgence. That one's available yep. on, you know, iTunes and Amazon. So we are working towards that. Uh, it's oh, just all them older projects. I got to go, you know, you got to dig them up. And react. Remember, I I didn't go to school for producing, and no, <laughs> you know, normally in a in a high end production, you'd have a sound guy, you'd have an yeah. editor, you'd have a color grader, you'd have all yeah. kinds of people involved. Like yeah. then you you'd have an assistant editor doing things, you'd have a final guy that exports everything. So I don't have all my we, stuff. Yeah. Like we have Jared, but on a lot of these projects, I didn't have enough disk space to do like an uncompressed QuickTime video, yeah. you know? So it's like, I got to go into all those projects and then there's certain things that I got to do mm -hmm. that won't pass the requirements for digital on some things into those older projects. So if it was as simple as I just got to hit export sure. on what's there and then it, get them, sent if it was that simple yeah you know un unfortunately it's also a process to get on those platforms and cost quite a bit of money um you know whereas like youtube I, yeah i can upload it right now i, I mean i loved that with, with yeah that, that that piece we just put up yeah it's super simple mm -hmm. you know but um yeah the you know and, the, and there's yeah. there's other methods of you know to 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 probably make enough money to make the wheels turn on youtube but you know, because I don't do sponsors and I really don't want to go down that road, mm -hmm. um, that that's one stream of income that I can't capitalize on. Yeah. Right? And then, you know, you don't know the future of, of the YouTube, like, will they sure, sure. eventually, so you can't watch the kill shots. Or Absolutely. Things like that. Right. You don't, you're, you're kind of at the mercy of that too. So, um, any big decisions like that, I, I you know, it, it, it's, yeah, of course, everybody would want it on YouTube, you know, mm -hmm. it's uh, watch it right now. You know, I, I'd love to do that, too, if I could keep the wheels turning. <laughs> well, yeah, dude, I'm, I'm assuming you've got, I mean, think of how much content that you have from a white tail adrenaline that, that frankly never made it to the final copy that could be a five minute YouTube video or seven minute yeah. YouTube. I'm sure there's a ton of like funny stuff out there and, and entertaining yeah. things that right. could make an entire white tail adrenaline YouTube channel. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and we've talked about that. The, the dilemma is a lot of, a lot of moving parts, you know, it's, sure. it's like, I don't, I don't, you know, I wish I had a hundred hours in the day, you know, I've got, we're backed up in emails and things right now that, you know, I, I caught a few last night, the people messaging, Hey, I didn't hear anything on the email side of things. And it's like, I, I, you know, 
I've got some notes here that I got to get get to today because you know, but I, I don't have a hundred hours in a day. I wish I did. Yeah. Uh, because it, then some of those things that we were just talking about, it's like, so hard. Truck, it's so up. hard, dude. On the ride and stuff. It's and I said even you heard me at the beginning of our podcast. Like I I really want to lower decky nice. I I uh, I want to stay up with everybody. I really do. Like I said, we want to you know be able to respond to people and stuff. But it's just like. Dude, I can't, I just, I just can't. I don't have the brain capacity to read. Mm -hmm. And everybody wants to send, you know, a long, thoughtful, thoughtful paragraph and stuff. And, and like, we appreciate it. Right? I, absolutely. Well, I, I have do, done I the do same thing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That keeps you like reminding you of, yes. you, you know, you're impacting people in a positive way, you know? Yeah. So it's great to hear that and, and, and see that. Um, but yeah, it does. I battled with that years ago when I started to get overloaded. Like, yeah, you there's not enough time in the day to do it all and you just do it the best you can. And what I learned a few years ago is if, if you don't take a little bit of time and you don't set up a little bit of boundary for yourself, then you'll completely fry and you'll completely burn out. Yep. So you got to have that. And everybody has a different level. You know, some people 40 hours a week is all the, the max. And then they got to, you know, max I don't need way. a lot of extra, I don't need to take a lot of time to, to keep myself regrouped. That's mm -hmm. one thing I'm blessed on and fortunate on, yep. you know, I mean, I can work those hundred hour weeks and, and stay pretty not burnt out. I don't, but I don't see a wedding ring on your finger. I assume is a part of that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, a I, little bit of I freedom don't. doesn't hurt. I mean, I mean, yeah, I'm busy, but I'm also, uh, you know, I haven't actually dated that much in my life. Um, yeah, you know, I, there's been a few times, but, uh, I, you know, it's, it's just, um, not, uh, I, I'm pretty particular, you know, I want to make sure that if I ever go down that road, it's with the right person. So, yeah, absolutely. Well, I think you've got a unique lifestyle, man. Maybe you find yourself a nice Des Moines woman. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, maybe someday. <laughs> well, dude, it's, I think it's, uh, That's all right, dude. it's a challenging thing. Uh, and, and here I'll say this, Jared, like the fact is, is, you know, and one of the reasons we have you on here is that we have thoroughly enjoyed whitetail adrenaline because of what it is and what it's, what it's been and where it is now. And I said it earlier and I, I, I really wasn't kidding is, you know, I, I can't remember exactly it was sometime this fall when you said, Hey, I'm setting the date and I'm going to give you updates and there was general concern from, I think, a lot of us, your fans, that it's like, man, uh, like, I want this. Like, I'm glad he's passionate. I also, like, I don't want him to to, to destroy himself over this either. Like, we're yeah. here to still, we're still behind you regardless of what happens here. We appreciate that you're holding yeah. yourself to that. But, man, uh, we also knew, like, this thing was weighing heavy on you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it began to, you know, I I was pretty fortunate that I didn't, it didn't start weighing on me until, until late summer. Yeah. You know, uh, well, really actually early fall, September. Yeah. That's when it started weighing on me. You yeah. know, I was pretty good until then. Once I didn't hit that last 30 day deadline where I thought I'd be done by the end of August. Yeah. And then it began to really, really, because it's like, you know, I'm trying and, and doing the best I can over here and, and I'm getting frustrated because. Sure that's when it really started to, to, to weigh on me. And, uh, yeah, you know, that last, I think it was that last week of September. Um, that's where it really started to, that's all right, dude, let it run. Yeah. Um, that's where it really started to, to affect me. Otherwise yeah. I stayed pretty, pretty solid all the way through. Like, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's unfortunate where it's at, but you know, I'm doing the best I can here producing it to what I, see it to be and or what what i vision for it and and uh you know thankfully we do have a very very loyal base and super and, loyal um, man you know i didn't want it to turn into like a self-suffering thing either you know of of uh around that late september when i started to crack but i mean i was literally starting to contemplate like you know do i want you know can i continue doing this and, mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, um, 
but you know, you got to be careful with that. You go down that self-suffering mm -hmm. victim, I, you know, even, even if you've put yourself through hell to, you know, I mean, working those hours, extreme hours and doing that and pushing, you know, yeah, you, you know, you, you want to justify, you know, the, the, the mind is so powerful. It wants to justify a little bit of that man, I'm put, doing everything I can here. And, oh, yeah. and, you know, it wants to justify, like you have the right to, to, to go down that road and, and it's not a good pathway to go down that. No, um, man. So, I, and, and we're all human. We all do it. That's to a it, man. Degree, yeah. I can only imagine the, I mean, we could see it in the videos that you were putting it out. I mean, I, it's, you know, for Jeremy and I, it just kind of like, uh, you know, we'd see that and I would, be, and we don't have a, a stake in the game, right? Like we didn't order the DVD until after it was released and everything like that. So it's not like we're, come on, come on. You know, we're just watching, you know, and imagining like the mental, uh, the weight, like just the, the process to go through that, to sit down every day and be doing 80 to a hundred hours, knowing that you originally set the goal for yourself to set it out the previous Christmas is like, I, dude, yeah. I, can't, I can't imagine the weight that was lifted when you finally were able to put that out and could feel good about the, you know, the final product. Yeah, yeah no, it, it did feel, feel really good. And, and then getting into November, I, I mean, I just, I wanted to have in October, I wanted to have trailer videos done and shorts and all kinds of things. And, and yeah. really, you know, we haven't even really started promoting uncuffed since it started shipping, yep. you yeah. know, or even in November, you know, uh, I was getting those shorts up every day back there in August and September pretty much. But, but, you know, I do want to step back into that, yeah, but now I've got shows coming up and right. it's like, I, you know, and I've, uh, you know, I've, I've, uh, had a lot of different things there that I've had to step into that, that I'm, uh, you know, getting ready for shows and, and things like that, that, uh, require a lot of time and it's like man where'd my day go i know, you know? well <laughs> you know, and like, as exhausting as those shows are because i know I, i've worked a lot of them i hope that it's also a little bit of reinvigoration from it is. the standpoint for you because you see how much it means to so many of us yep, yep. Uh, you know that's one thing last show season it was a pretty special show season in in not you, you know we ha hadn't had a new release come out for, for, you know, now it's three years, you know, it, it was three years, but, um, you know, our, you know, we didn't sell a pile of stuff at the shows, but just hearing from people, you mm -hmm. know, so what you just talked about, you know, there's a, there's a love hate thing with shows because <laughs> you go there and, and by the end of it, you've talked so much. Oh, and if yeah. you're not, I'm more by nature an introvert where I, I, I can be by myself pretty well and kind of get sucked into whatever it is editing or or building 40 inch arrows or whatever mm. you know <laughs> yeah um, uh, you know i can operate pretty well like that you know and i have a certain level of extrovert socializing but by the end of those shows yeah you're you're zonked you're talked out um but it's great at the same point you know mm. i had that last show i did in the dells i had a couple that uh shared how much the videos meant to them and they were i mean they brought me to tears uh you know i mean yeah it, you know i don't think any that's ever happened at a show but just seeing how much it impacted them you know and you know this older you know it was an older couple and and uh just just hearing those stories or you know sometimes you get a little kid come up you know one one was 11 you know he, he came up and i, I shot my first buck and it was on the ground and it was this 10 pointer and he showed me the pit. It's cool. You yeah, know, it's, it's awesome, man. Reminds you, you know, and I was in a place of, you know, where it's like, wh what am I, is this all I'm supposed, you know, you can, sometimes you don't see maybe how it's affecting people in a positive way of what you're doing. And, you know, and I was looking at like, oh, I'm just producing these videos and, you know, uh, you know, I kind of gotten to a point where I didn't, didn't realize maybe how well, how much it was affecting certain people. And, you know, I looked at it like it's just a hunting video, sure. but you know, to some of these people that came to the shows, they don't, you, you know, especially this last show season, uh, you know, opening up and telling me how much they, it impacted them in certain ways. And mm. it's just like, Wow, I didn't ever see that. Thank you for sharing that with me. That's huge, you know? man. And uh, I mean, that's what keeps you going. Because I mean, you know, we talked about it at the beginning of this thing is like the reason you got down this path is 
because you loved hunting. You love deer hunting, right? You love bow hunting. And so right. we talk about it all the time is that, you know, as much as we want to keep doing all that and stuff, what I don't want to ever do is remember why we started it to begin with, right? Right. Because then I'll, that's where you start to stray down the path of what am I doing here? Why am I doing this? Um, yeah, that's where you begin to lose the heart and soul of what you do because you lose the love for it. There you go. You lose the passion for it. Yeah, and I think you see that a lot on the, or you did see that a lot on the television side. A lot of those guys will tell you straight up that they were entertainers. That that's who they were. They they were entertainers first, hunters second. Um, and yeah. I've got a bit of a bitter bitter taste on now, and I don't I don't like that when people say that because it's just like, <laughs> man, that really. That's that's not why I do it. That's not why I thought I even liked your show at one point. Not your show, but their show, right? right. Uh, it's like I thought you were a hunter, and you re- you're telling me now you were an entertainer first, hunter second. Like that 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 doesn't sit well. Right, right. Yeah, no, I can I can see that, and that's when I, you know, when we talk about characters like a Chancy or something, it's like, I mean that guy is a hunter and he's also an entertainer. Yeah, that dude's ate up with it. That, yeah. That's like, the, the, you know, I, I, that I look for guys like that, you yeah. know, and the, the guy that that usually is, is the guy that don't give a shit if the camera's there at all. Mm-hmm. You know, right. like, yeah, he's going to go do the same thing. The true authentic mm-hmm. character is the guy that just doesn't really care. Yeah. Um, the, the guy that really cares, he goes more into a conscious, Oh, yep. I got to explain this. I got to, portray myself as this i gotta do this i gotta you know now you're being somebody that you're not exactly you know and and it's it's very difficult to find somebody that absolutely is loves hunting is really good at it and is an entertainer and and everything so um and that you know i've been blessed to come across a, a handful of those that fit that you know, Chancy, I met him years ago and I knew. Yeah. Okay. This guy <laughs> This guy's got you know, something he's, here. <laughs> he's he's the full package here. He's the <laughs> you know, this is who he is. You now know? you and, just gotta and, get him off of the damn boat catching he's ripping bass every damn time I reach out to him. Well, yeah, he he's a very he's got a he's got a lot of moving parts in his life. Uh <laughs> well, I'll tell you though, that guy will grind. Oh yeah. Know? Yeah, you know, I mean, this year it was he he had he had a bit of a struggle city, you know, on on uh you know, he he was on this one big buck for several times a, a mega giant and and uh you know, there were some close calls there, but you know, he never ended up getting that deer, but that guy will not give up. Like mm-hmm. he just goes. I think he had 20 it was probably 25 days straight i mean he just <laughs> wrote he runs it and i'm talking daylight to dusk i mean mm-hmm. he's, he'll, he'll grind it for 30 days straight so when he when he switches <coughs> from fishing to hunting it's full tilt yeah full you tilt know? Huh. you know um that's funny man so and tanner tanner the same way you know he ran in uncuffed it was 120 days 119 or 121 i think he broke 120 holy straight. cow never never went home not nothing you know, <laughs> he, he maybe took a day off in a motel after packing elk out jeez um, you know, there's a couple days like that i think he had but he was still on the road i mean he just gave it that's i mean he did that before just on his own too you yeah, know, run, run hard. Like I told him that season on Guff when he was about 120 in, I said, "Get your ass home for Christmas. You're gonna burn yourself." <laughs> yeah, you're gonna be toast, man. <laughs> wow, that's amazing, man. Well, it's, it it you know, obviously, you, it doesn't come without struggles. But you know, you guys have built an amazing brand, and and like you said, you've got such a great group of people, including us, who are just always looking forward to the new content coming out. And um, you know, I think that. I don't know if that will ever change, man, because I think even now you guys are still very unique in what you, what you do. And that's probably what makes it very attractive to, to most of us. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And the next, don't expect a 15 hour series. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let's get this out on the record now. Right. The, the next one I think is going to come in at about eight. So oh. that'll, that's, 
And that's further produced than this one was when I got my hands on it. So yeah, it'll, it'll feel like a cakewalk compared to this project. Hmm. Well, um, you need to just make sure you get yourself out uh, hunting in 24 yeah. for sure. Yeah. You know, and, and you know, as far as the next, the next two seasons coming out are going to be bangers, bangers, yeah. awesome seasons, awesome content. So I'm excited about that. Um, we got a lot of things to be excited about a lot of, a lot of blessed things. So, um, well, so now everybody that's hearing this knows that they can see you in Harrisburg, they can see you in Columbus, they can see you in the Dells, and they can see you at the Iowa Deer Classic. So, you got those four places. I mean, right now, still best place to buy it straight from your website, right? Yep. Yep. That. And then the DVD players, you can get them on Amazon. <laughs> I recommend the Sony's. Uh, <laughs> I, I think I'm going to pick up some DVD players actually for people. We get people that buy the full collection and just then bundle it I'm, up and send it. I with think, them. I think I am. I think I'm going to get them the whole nine yards, the HDMI cable, the DVD player, like get your DVDs. <laughs> oh, that's so, so funny, man. It'd be so, perfectly um, set up. And then, I mean, obviously you've got, in fact, um, I usually break it out for Kansas. You know, I've got my orange, White tail adrenaline hoodie with the uh, beer koozie built in. Oh, you got that? Oh, damn straight, I got that. That's my classic. Oh, I didn't know that. oh yeah, that's my classic. When we're skinning in Kansas, got my beer and my koozie holder. Yeah, there that's you go. yeah, that's the. Well, deer, make sure the deer you're cat. not. Oh yeah, if you're hanging them up, yeah, you bend over to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's my that's my I'll be deer, down camp, there. <laughs> uh, deer camp hoodie uh, for Kansas for sure. But yeah, no, yeah. I mean it's it's. I, I like I said, I think that. Um, all of us that have watched it for so long, just, you know, we, we feel good about the relationship. And, and to be honest, man, kudos to you, because I feel like, you know, uh, you're, you, you're what we, you know, imagine you, you see what you get type of guy type of thing. And I, that is, Thanks. I think pretty important in today's industry with everything we've talked about is the authenticity that comes through is, you know, it, it means yeah. a lot, I think, to the, to the consumer at the end of the day. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I agree with that. And that, that's, uh, I think that's, that's what, you know, from getting into it, it's like, if, if you, you know, the, and I've heard many people that have gotten somehow involved in the industry and, and kind of burn out on hunting and burn out on it. You know, I've, I've heard that over the years, you know, um, that it's quite prevalent. And I think, I think a person that is looking to get into, you know, you got to stay true as true as you can without compromising yourself. Yep to, to, to keep it, you know, and I, I did begin to lose, you know, my love for, uh, you know, the whole thing, you know, I, 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 I did, I, you know, the last thing to go for me was the hunting, yeah. you know, and finally, finally that went to where I really didn't even, didn't even care. And I got it back, you know, a uh, mm -hmm. lifelong buddy of mine, he, he predicted that it would come back and it did. And it came back very strong. Yeah. Um, so it, it was probably always there. It's probably not so much that I lost the love for it. Yeah. It's just with everything. Got buried. And, 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 and burning the midnight oil at both ends mm -hmm. and, and all that, it just got lost and it got buried down in there. So, so that's far. the danger of this space, man. I mean, all of us got into the space because we loved it, but it will also damn near grind it out of you just as fast if you aren't careful. Yeah. Right. And that goes, I think about life too. Oh, yeah. You know, if you don't guard what's inside you and, you know, protect that and, you know, we can get so busy with, I got to do this, I got to do that. But if you don't really take care of yourself, how you need to, you'll eventually yep. just decompose and, and crumble. And, and I, I'm, you know, I don't need to go into the details, but I'm a living example of that. Too young for that shit, man. A lot of, a lot of life left to live, uh, to have <laughs> exactly. that. Exactly. I right feel now. like I'm freaking 20 right now. So <laughs> I do. Seriously. I got my shit together and got my life on track. There you go, man. And, uh, learned a lot in the process. So, um, that's awesome. So I'm, I'm ready to move forward with the second half of the life. You there know? you go. Very cool, man. Well, I'm hoping I'll be there. I don't know. I think I'm going in like Sunday and I might be there a little bit Monday in Harrisburg. So okay. I'll make sure I stop over at the booth and, and yeah, say for hi. Sure. And for sure. Um, we'll try to have a cold bush light. Waiting mm, for you. I'm going to, I'm going to be on the beach somewhere. I'll pour one out for you. I'll pour one out for you guys. <laughs> a little uh, yeah. mojito in the sand or something. <laughs> we'll be, we'll Where are you going? Florida, Florida. 
Uh, the Virgin you Islands. Going? Oh, you dirty yeah. uh, <laughs> we'll be We'll be sucking in the dust from the farm show remnants at, in Harrisburg. Yeah. My parents were trying to, I was going with my parents. They were trying to get us go for two weeks. I was like, I can't, I'm not retired. I can't just go on a two week <laughs> vacation. Like I got stuff to do. So we, I cut it back to one week, but uh, yeah, yeah, well, I could just oh, sit, sit around thing. for two you weeks. You poor thing. You can't go for two weeks. I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have a yeah, No, that's what we were just talking about. You gotta, you gotta take you time. Fill the cup yeah. back up for sure. Yeah. We, we grind hard all year long and uh so we, my wife and around a seasonal business uh, in addition to what jeremy and i do and so this okay. this is our time to to get a week for you know for each other and, mm-hmm. and to re- refresh so well jared and i will drink a bush light for you that's fine i appreciate it we'll, yeah we'll, we'll yep, have you yep, covered we'll so for, we'll do that for you awesome i am i am <laughs> bummed i'm gonna miss that uh yeah. meeting at the mine so yeah well, dude, we appreciate you spending a, a large chunk of your morning with us, man. It's um, it, yeah, it's cool that well, dude, it's cool to finally have these kind of discussions because, like I said, I mean, we've been we've been watching and we've been part of that that white tail adrenaline army for you know from the get go. Um, like Jared said, we used to pass them around the office and have them streaming on a TV in somebody's office, and then they're done with that DVD and we switch out and stuff. And um, yeah. I you know I really do that. The hard part is I think that you know the the way content's been consumed has changed so much. I think you guys were kind of ahead of the curve, you know, back in the, you know, 2008, 9, 10 timeframe. Um, and that, you know, then it kind of caught up and then, you know, you get COVID curve balls and all these other things that kind of hit you. But, you know, I think all along you've stayed very true to the audience, um, which is why, you know, everybody gets so passionate about when's the next thing coming out? What, who's on this, you know, what's Chansey into? And, you know, that's, that's, I think, what will continue to drive that brand forward for as long as you want to do it, man. I don't think that you'll have any, I don't think you'll have any trouble keeping the people tapped into it. We're ahead of the curve for you younger generations. What a DVD is. <laughs> Digital video disc. Okay. It's a, <laughs> you own it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, that's no, freaking I, hilarious, but, man. No, well, we're, you know, I'd love to have all the old stuff on digital and, and, you know, hopefully over the next couple of years, we can make all of that happen and yeah. make them available on digital. Well, I mean, we get that a lot from young, young generation, you know, young kids and stuff. What's the DVD mom? You know, we got them at the booth. Like, what's oh, a DVD dude. player? Well, like, when I buy one to watch this, I'm, people are going to come to my house. I'll be like, what's that? I'm like, that's my white tail adrenaline machine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's my white tail adrenaline machine. We just machine. have to put a I sticker like, right on like the top that. of it. There you I go. like that. That's why we, that that's DVD, what we play white tail adrenaline. If I do that DVD player deal, if I end up doing that, I'm going to have to put a sticker on them all. Go for it. White tail adrenaline machine. You can have it. That's fine. Adrenaline machine. This, this is it. This this goes into this machine. Yeah, that's how that works. <laughs> What's yeah. that? That's what we play white white tail adrenaline with. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Very funny, man. Yeah. Well, cool, cool, dude. Well, we look forward to seeing you in here in a couple Absolutely. weeks. And uh, like sure. I said, appreciate all the time this morning. And um, glad that that things are straight. Glad we'll do that, it again too, if you're yeah. willing. Once we get this yeah. washed up, we'll yeah. uh, we'll reconvene. Yeah, watch watch that up and. Let me know what you think. Uh, For sure, man. But, uh, yeah, I mean, maybe by the time you come to Harrisburg, but that's like 15 hours, so that's like one day of your time. Man. I've that's got my D- I've got my white tail adrenaline machine set up. I just I've got to now insert the DVDs to let it let it do okay, its next day. Next step, let me walk you through this. Okay, <laughs> Logan was supposed to get get me a video around Christmas time of walking the children through what a DVD is and <laughs> steps. And you hit the eject button, and this tray mm-hmm. pops out, and you insert the disc and you know, and, and walk you through. So yeah, that's the next step. You've got mm-hmm. the DVDs. I've got next it. Next step. Open open the slot on the white teledrenaline machine. Insert, Insert. this. Yeah. I, yep. I, I did code the menu system. So for people that lost their DVD remotes, don't worry. It'll it'll only play the menu for 30 seconds and automatically start uh, playing. See, that's if a big you one. Your DVD remote. That's the way I coded it. Although so. I, I kind of liked having this cyclic uh, music and opening screen on my TV when I was taking phone calls or doing emails, like the, yeah. the intense suspense music just playing yeah, yeah, and just yeah. start. Yeah. So. Yeah. I, I, I didn't loop it this time. That's how I did it. And I was like, <laughs> you know, by this era, most people have probably lost their remotes. I better yeah. not. Put yeah. them through we that, don't even have the so. damn machine, let alone a remote. I, so yeah, I, all I can watch is the menu. I lost my remote. <laughs> <laughs> oh shit, man, that's funny. Well, cool, dude. But we appreciate it, and uh, absolutely. yeah, let's absolutely make sure we do this again. For sure, for sure. Thanks for having me on, guys. All right, buddy. Thank right, you. Buddy. We'll talk. Right. The Hunter Podcast is brought to you by Sever. 
Well, one of the biggest things that we always talk about is what our arrow setups are. And this year we're shooting the Sever Broadheads. I think we're both shooting the new two inch titanium broadhead. And so, you know, we're huge proponents of expandables. And I know we've had this argument back and forth with people, but we just- We're we, right and you're wrong. And that's, you just need to accept it. We just want to have <laughs> a giant wound that pumps out blood. That's the bottom line. We build our arrow setups and shoot bows, you know, to maximize penetration. And we shoot broadheads that are going to give us the best blood trails, you know, the most hemorrhage possible. Uh, and so part of those setups is we're also shooting the Eastern arrows here coming up pretty soon. So we've, yep. we've shot the victory in the past mm -hmm. and you know, there's all kind of great arrow shafts on the market, but like we're looking for a whole system from broadhead to arrow components to the arrow shaft itself. And uh, you know, the more we look at some of these Eastern shafts and the components that go with them, that setup's going to be really deadly for us. Yeah. I'm actually using the Eastern traditional axis right now uh, in my traditional setups for both my recurve and my longbow. I've got a hundred grain brass insert on those and then obviously I'm using a fixed blade broadhead on on those specific shafts right on so but yeah our goal is always to be shooting the best broadhead that we think is going to be the most lethal for our setups we've done plenty of research we believe in the sever broadheads and we hope you would check them out at sever broadheads as well and awesome oh yeah mm -hmm. I mean it, it, funny like it's uh yeah, it, it's a weird thing because I don't know. I mean, I've, I've probably met Jared in passing at one of the shows, but I don't think I've ever had I've a, seen him. And I was I had the intention of introducing myself yeah. and I checked out. Yeah. I was like, there's too many people here. Yeah. <laughs> and so, but... Hi, but I'm Jared watched, also. Want to be on my podcast? Yeah. But having watched <laughs> him for a decade, it's like, man, I, like, I feel like I know him when I'm talking to him. Oh, yeah. Um. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a cool thing. I mean... First of all, like what uh, uh that if anything you get from that is that dude pours his heart and soul into this. Oh yeah, like there is no doubt he's an artist. Yeah, I mean, almost m surprising, I guess a little bit. Like I knew he really cared about. I first of all, I was like, man, this guy does all the production work. Like it's a ton of stuff on his shoulders, you know. But really, like I mean, he is very particular about the outcome of the production and the oh, quality yeah. of production, which I guess maybe I overlooked, to be honest, um, before this conversation. Well, it's a tough situation because like that is what yields such a great product. Like mm -hmm. when we can watch this and it's just, it's a masterpiece. I mean, it's, it's mm -hmm. 15 hours just, you know, to start, but it's like, it's beautifully done. Everything's mm -hmm. tied together. The quality is like, is very good, mm -hmm. but you can also see the toll that it takes on Jared. You know, I mean, he's, he'll be the first to tell you like, man, I, you yeah, know, it sucked it out of me for for years. There's been times where I just I didn't even want to hunt. Season fourteen. That's I was just looking on there. So yeah, but it's nice to see him now. Like you said, you know, fourteen seasons into it, uh, he had a pretty good reset check. There. Well, recognizing that in himself, just yeah, seeing that he's just like mm -hmm. I, I can't do this forever. Like I, mm -hmm. it's just not going to work. So yeah, you got to find a happy medium to where you can continue to put you know out a product that you're happy with, but that you can go on living your life too. It's not mm -hmm. all consuming. Yeah. Yeah, I mean that if anything, I think his message there is like there's regardless of being in the industry or not, like the work life balance is uh <laughs> unbelievably critical. Oh yeah. And and when you are passionate about something and you are dedicated to delivering something, there's a lot of sacrifices that are going to be made. Well, and it's not going to balance itself. Like you have to make a cognitive decision to take time for yourself mm -hmm. and take care of yourself. Yeah. Crazy to see, but Super stoked though now that we have this and we now have our uh, white tail adrenaline machines to be able <laughs> to 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 watch it to to get into it because man it was it's funny like it's hard for me to believe it was you know whatever 2016 or 17 when we were passing those DVDs around in our office oh, yeah. at Stone Road Media watching Dude, that was a, a central theme to like the building blocks of our relationship it was like yeah new DVDs came in here's three you start with here's three <laughs> yeah. I start with then we swap we all them. had them in our desk we're like which one do you have I have a three six and two. Yeah. So, but, but really cool to obviously talk with Jared and, uh, excited to watch this thing, excited to, to, you know, not chicken out and stop by and see him at the, I remember that that was that great American outdoor, right? Mm -hmm. When we passed him, we're like, we should go talk with Jared. And mm -hmm. then it was like, like, no, it's not the, not the right time. Not the, not right, the right time. time. He's probably busy. <laughs> he's already got stuff. He didn't. Yeah. Well, they have busy. a giant booth there. I mean, it's yeah. a lot of people come with them and they're selling apparel and stuff. So yeah, it is fun. I, I do love that. Uh, my dear camp hoodie for, 
for my, it's great my Kansas. I know exactly things. what hoodie you're talking mm-hmm. about. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, but anyways, we appreciate having uh, Jared Scheffler on to talk to us about what he told Jalen and everything that he's gone through to, to get to this point and super, I mean, man, if anything, if you, ha- first of all, if you haven't seen any of the DVD start somewhere, I, I mean, you've got hundreds of hours of content if, to watch. Yeah, if by chance you've never come across why I tell Adren- like if by chance, like I said, and you are, can start from the very beginning, like do I, it. I, I envy you. Just yeah. just make unlike, time. Unlike our podcast where we say don't start at episode one, yeah. I would go back go to Go back Jared. to the very beginning. Buy every single DVD. Yeah. It's just get you get your uh white tail adrenaline machine and just start from the beginning. Ah. Uh. I probably I at some point that's a great off season thing. I know mine I think are all stacked over here. Like I need to go back and and dive into it after we watch on cuff. But um yeah, absolutely. It, just not only like super entertaining, these dudes get on some mega giants. Oh yeah. Uh in the words of Chancey Walter, some magnums. Magnums. Um and so yeah, really cool. Um appreciate Jared stopping by and yeah, we will absolutely have to get him back on in the future here. For sure. All right, uh, we appreciate you listening to this episode, and we'll catch you next week. Later. It take me. Oh.